It's a Friday morning. Welcome to the AM News. My name is Pakwesi Shandov. To a very first story, the Dean of the University of Cape Coast, Professor John Gachi, says failure to deal with illegal mining will have dire consequences on the country. He believes Galamse would not only affect the safety of food crops and the health of residents, but could also lead to food terrorism, among others. He was speaking at the World Teachers Day celebration in Ho. Our communities are now exposed to chaos and damaging activities of illegal mining operators. Our major water bodies are polluted and contaminated with different hazardous chemicals that will aggravate diseases relating to internal organs such as the liver, kidney, and the heart, as well as eye problems. Unfortunately, the failure to deal with this terrible situation is being trivialized with sweet leadership point. The reality is that every part of Ghana will soon be affected by Galaxy. We will soon be faced with food terrorism, chemically induced agricultural produce, and be burdened with costs of procuring drugs to treat unwarranted associated sicknesses. Illegal mining and its effects on the environment, health, education, agriculture, and national security is showcasing the state is anemic and powerless. Military task forces were deployed. Major Mahama was killed in the process. Excavators were seized and returned to those known to be politically connected. The impression of weakness is disturbing. Do we want to say we do not have what it takes to stop this to save Ghana? It is clear that pollution of water bodies and crime, and crime against the environment are crimes against humanity. Why is the state docile? Meanwhile, the opposition National Democratic Congress has criticized government's commitment against the fight against Gullam State. Speaking at a press conference on Thursday, the National Communications Officer of the NDC, Samit Enfi, described the fight as a sham. We in the NDC have always maintained that as far as we are concerned, and as the evidence bears us out, the Akufuado Bawumia MPP government has not exhibited any genuine commitment to the fight against illegal mining. And that their so-called fight against Galamse is nothing but a scam. Indeed, we have always told Ghanaians that the single most important thing needed to wage a successful war against illegal mining in Ghana is the political will of the duty bearers of the country to confront the menace and all the dark forces fueling it, regardless of whose ox is God. It has, however, been clear to us from day one that behind the facade of the so-called Galamse fight of the Akufuado Bagumia government is a well-crafted ruse designed to appropriate the illicit Galamse trade for MPP apparatchiks and higher ups in the Akufuado Bagumia government and their foreign collaborators. Time without number, we have got the clearest confirmation from countless instances of state-backed complicity, active participation, and sometimes clear aiding and abetment of illegal mining activities, not only by officials of the New Patriotic Party, but by some of the very men and women in the Akufuado Bawomia government entrusted with the responsibility of protecting our environment. Ladies and gentlemen, how can the man, President Akufuado, who stood on a political campaign platform in the year 2016 in Obwase and promised to promote illegal mining, aka Galamse, when elected, lecture us on the need to depoliticize the fight against illegal mining. How is that even possible? And maybe somebody is hearing this for the first time. The person may not know 
that President Ekufuado actually promised to promote Galamse, and he made that promise on the campaign platform for votes. And so today, if he turns around to talk to us, sermonize about not politicizing Galamse, we should be asking him to be apologizing for that, first of all. The party here, Sika Scandal, once again exposes President Ekufuado and the ruling MPP as being the chief corpus of the politicization of the fight against Galamse. Let's still stay on the NDC, where a national chairman, aspirant Samuel Yao Iduse, is rallying behind former president John Romani Mahama to lead the party in the upcoming 2024 general election. He, however, believes that the incumbent general secretary, Johnson Asiedun Kitia, and the present national chairman, Samuel Yao Fusuwampofu, did not perform their duties properly, reason for which the party lost in the 2016 and the 2020 general election. He therefore believes that the two should be ousted. Internal general elections within the National Democratic Congress beckons with some party members already filing nominations. The major opposition party is expected to hold its constituency, regional and national elections to elect new party leaders. However, a section of the party members are opposing the re-election of some incumbent national executives, particularly the chairman, Samuel Ofosiampofu, and the party's longest serving general secretary, Johnson Esiedun Ketia. Aspiring national chairman, Samuel Eduse, blames the two for the party's loss in the last two general elections. If someone is not performing, if a party has to be dynamic, you don't let someone who is not getting the results to continue. You don't have to talk about track record. You don't have to talk about, um, I've known him, he's my friend, we have worked together. That's not what you're talking about. We are talking about getting the results. And consecutively, from 2016, 2020, we haven't gotten the results. These two people who have declared their intention to contest played a major role. In 2016, they have an asset. If I talk about an asset, we are talking about the first time that in an eighth year of a party in power, the flabber or the president qualifies to be the flabber of the party. They missed that opportunity. You do not get the results. Second time in 2020, for the first time, we have immediate, we had immediate past president becoming the flabber of the party the major opposition party, we did not get the results. This is how serious the whole thing is. And these two people who played major role in all these two consecutive elections are telling us, moving around, telling us that they want to do it again. Some of us, if, if no one is, I am fed up with excuses. Today, easy. Tomorrow, police. Today, this. I am fed up. After the passing of Jerry John Warren, some of us expected that the leadership of the party we we'll make some steps to plan and rebuild the foundation of the party for the next generation. From 2021, 2022, up to this time, I haven't seen the leadership making any effort in that direction. The former Deputy Minister for Works and Housing wants the party to define, identify and recognize the status of ex-President John Mahama. He reiterated calls to support the 2020 presidential candidate to lead the party in the 2024 general elections to regain power in what he termed Block the Eight. So if you defy the status of his assessment of Romani Mama, he's a former president, fine. He's the only former president, former president alive in the party, so he's a father, fine. That's the definition. How do you identify him? You identify him that in all this he has a time to go. And for that matter, he must be recognized. How do you recognize him? If you have someone in this situation, I think that there should be a way of uniting the party behind the person. And that there is the need for all of us to unite behind him so that we can rescue power from the NPP in 2024, so that we can block them from breaking the eight. The National Congress for the NDC is slated for December 17, 2022. For Joy News, Emmanuel Bright Kweku reporting. In a related development, some members of the ruling New Patriotic Party who are rooting for Minister for Trades and Industry, Alan Kodio Tremantin, to become the party's flag bearer in 2024 say that their candidate is making significant inroads, especially in the Ashanti region. Pro Alan Group Pearl Ladies say that Alan has chances of taking the party to break the AIDS. President of the chapter, Martina Sona, made this disclosure during a health walk in Kumasi. 
Some residents in Kumase in August embarked on a health walk to express gratitude and support for the Trade and Industry Minister, Alan Kojoche Mantin. According to the group, it was time to showcase their son and hero to the world as tradition demands. Though the new patriotic party is yet to open a campaign for the flag bearer race, the Pearl Ladies say their observation put the stalwart in clear lead. Martina Swena is president of Pearl Ladies. It has really gained a momentum because when you go to the grounds, you realize that the um, majority of the people felt like Alan Kojocha Martin is not coming. Some are saying that it's like he's slow, he's slow. But right after the walk that we had, then most of the delegates realized that indeed the man is coming and of course the people of Asante Mai really love this man and that they want this man to come and lead them. So it has really gained a momentum. <laughs> As for that one, I really don't want to put it out, but we are really working. We are working underground. We are doing groundwork. Yes. The group visited the Kumasi Central Mosque to seek prayers for their preferred candidate, the Ashanti Regional Chief Imam, Sheikh Abdul Mumin Harun advised followers of persons aspiring to lead the new patriotic party in the next election to operate within the laws. The group has also donated food items to Ashan Children's Home, providing educational materials to Bethlight International School and Katab Education Complex. Let's now turn our attention to the Ashanti region where the educational directorate in Old Tafo Abegopadin is urging final year students to desist from engaging in acts of vandalism after the completion of their final exams. Now, the Municipal Director of Education, Betsy Dra, says that this does not augur well for the students as, and the school as it leads to the destruction of lives and property. About 2,000 students are registered to sit the basic education certificate examination in the municipality. In 2021, the municipality made a 95% pass rate, expecting an improvement in the coming examination. The education unit in preparing students for the examination is burdened with curbing notoriety among students after writing their final examination. Director of Education, Betty Dra, reveals students have often clashed after examination. We have grouped our students into circuits and we are advising them on more practices. We also organize career guidance for them where they are supposed to uh, choose the right subjects. And in so doing, they will go a long way to select the right subjects that they will study at the SHS level. More so, at the end of the day, when they finish writing their exams, we don't want anybody to destroy any school property. Rather, they should go home peacefully. Students are also being advised against examination more practice. The education director says students are being trained to do independent work at the examination center. We are educating them not to involve themselves in, to, in any uh, examination or practice. Because this time, WAEC has also uh, streamlined things. And in that matter, the questions that are given out, even though they are the same questions, we have different uh, question and answers to numbers given assigned to those uh, questions. So if they depend on outside uh, uh, materials, they will fail. So they should focus on their study and learn hard. If they learn hard, they will be able to write successfully. Meanwhile, the National Coordinator for the National Alternative Employment and Livelihood Program, Dr. Sewa Donko, has donated some education materials to aid students sitting for the examination. Chief Anoche made the presentation on her behalf. Her own contribution is 2,000 pieces, 2,000 pieces of mathematical assets. She has come to donate these equipment to our younger ones, not mathematical sets alone. It comes along with 2,000 pieces of pens, 2,000 pieces of pencils, all in the name of supporting our younger ones as they take their, their BEC. 
Now, the Bono East Regional Minister, Kwesi Edujan, has appealed to stakeholders in the region, particularly parents and community leaders, to work towards ensuring the region achieves its target of vaccinating more than 200,000 children in the second phase of the National Polio Immunization Program. He notes that though the region achieved 109 success rates during the first phase of the exercise, more needs to be done with no child being left behind. But this year, Ghana completed its first round of a four-day national immunization drive against polio following a confirmation of two acute flaccid paralysis cases in the country. The Bono East region during this exercise exceeded its target of vaccinating its under-5 population by recording 109% of this target. The region is today commencing a second round of this exercise that seeks to protect the younger generation against the polio viruses. Bono East Regional Minister Kwasi Edujan, who led the campaign at a regional lunch in Kintampo, appealed to parents and all stakeholders to ensure that the region achieve its target of vaccinating 264,998 children across the region. In the first round polio campaign, the region's target was 229,926 children. However, as indicated by the regional health director, we exceeded this by a certain percentage, about 109% of our target, meaning that we did extremely well. Today, we are appealing to you once again to avail yourself. Let the children be available for this second phase of the vaccination. We are urging all stakeholders, the media, Nananum, the clergy, and community leaders to use your useful and very important platforms to be an advocate, to articulate this agent health needs for us. Regional Director of Health Services, Dr. Fred Admakubuatin, revealed that enough preparations are made to ensure that hard-to-reach areas in the eastern part of the region are reached to ensure that no child is left behind. Because of the nature of how we arrange for this, uh, as we are speaking now, almost all the hard-to-reach the areas, the island communities, the volunteers have already gone there and they are going to sleep over there. So you look at Kodjokrum, you look at Yeji, where they have to cross, uh, they are already there. And not only that, the very difficult areas that we will have to go, we, they have also gone there. Normally we make arrangements so that uh, we go there and then we make sure that we don't leave any child unvaccinated. Chief of Health and Nutrition at the UNICEF Ghana Country Office, Dr. Munal Shite, noted that as partners, UNICEF is excited that the Ghana Health Service has exceeded its first round target and asked that more needs to be done to ensure that not a single child is missed during the second round of the exercise. A big congratulations to the Ghana Health Service in general for doing a fantastic first round. Uh, it is not an easy task to reach out to 6.3 million children. And... Uh, the uh, Bono East team has reached over 250,000 children. While that has been said, as you know, there's always scope for improvement. And this time around, we want to learn from the shortcomings of the previous round. Uh, and based on that, uh, the, uh, at the national level, there has been an increase in teams. There has been a modification of the micro plans. And there has been more in, uh, resources pumped in to ensure that not a single child is missed. The four-day exercise is scheduled to take place between the 6th and 9th of October this year. Anna Sabit, Joy News, Kintampo. That's all for the news this morning. For more, log on to www.myjoyonline.com. My name is Pakwe Sishandov. Do have a blessed weekend. And I'll leave in the company of Benjamin Akakpo and Mapito CBD. Stay.
Well, here we are, time now for the news review as we get into the latest that the papers have to offer. And I'm joined by Samuel Kojo Brace, as always. Charlie Fabu. How are we? Uh, day. Uh, this is a UCC party meeting, a UG guy. Yeah, uh, I mean, you know. Uh, it's uh, only that you were not in Casford, at least. Yeah, that, you, that, you would have been able to relate because I'm an old vendor. But I think the University of Cape Coast did. I mean, when they saw my picture, they should have known that I am carved out for Casford. Uh, 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 maybe what they can do is to change my hall, I mean, uh, from their records and put Casford there. Here's something interesting. <laughs> when I got the, into the University of Ghana, uh, I didn't care two hoots whether it was Commonwealth. In fact, I had no interest. Okay. But there were people who had interest, who were hoping, praying, fasting to get Commonwealth Hall. Yeah, they yeah. didn't get yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. I who, Charlie, I didn't even mm. care. Okay. Got, got it. it. And later, but of course, we, yeah. we, lift, we lift the brand. <laughs> what do you see? We are old vandals and strong. Truth stands. Oh, Truth my goodness. stands. And that's why this morning, you know what I'll be firing? But I'm, I'm, no, 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 no. What are you firing? So, losing from both ends... Our natural resources in crisis mm. and our economy in tatters. Oh, okay. Losing from both ends. Mm. Our natural resources in crisis and our economy in tatters. Mm. That's what I'm going to be talking about. Well, when it comes to the natural resources, Gal, I'm saying, for example, um, <laughs> yeah, a little too late, but better late than never, mm. the meeting the president had with the National House of Chiefs. Mm. I've heard people say the chiefs do not have the power, you know, and that the president has the power, so he should crack the whip. But, you know, like the president stated, and, and it's a very, very powerful one that people haven't really averted their minds to. Mm. He said, in the olden days, you, the chiefs, were able to manage this whole mining process to the extent that it didn't really de uh, deteriorate. deteriorate our environment. Mm. When the, the, foreign, the Europeans arrived in Elmina, the reason why they, they called the town Elmina is because they saw our people doing mining. Which means that mining has been with us for all these years. Mm. So the chiefs had what it took to ensure that mining did not degenerate into something else. Mm. And that's why he says, look, I have tried from the political angle uh, or from the uh, administrative angle. It didn't work. Mm. Let me come back to you and see how we can partner to do this. So I think it's a good one. I only hope that we will give it power. It wouldn't be, you know, a surface or a surface, a surface dressing uh, you know, solution to this. It will be something that will give it that power that it deserves. Are you optimistic about be it? Be look, because look, our four forebears, mm -hmm. our forefathers, mm -hmm. they could have, yes, they didn't have the equipment we mm -hmm. have now and mm -hmm. all of that, but they could have been greedy. They could have really, yeah. you know, look at our water bodies. Yes. Yes, they knew there was gold down there. Yeah. And they could have also, they could have started this long before we were born. Mm. They didn't because of the sanctity of these natural resources. Yeah. That is why sometimes, look, let me tell you the whole bit about some water bodies being classified as, oh, there's a god here and a goddess there and all of that. Mm. All of that was just to create a certain fear yeah. in people, to prevent them from doing the things we are doing to our natural resources mm. now. It was just to, you know, it's just like the bit about, oh, you shouldn't be singing or whistling while you're having yeah, your bath. Yeah. The intent is just to ensure that lather doesn't get into doesn't, your yeah, mouth or yeah. eyes and stuff like that. That was the intent. Yeah. To protect them, to prevent people from overdoing it, even overfishing. Today, just a yati chain. We've just yeah. destroyed everything. That's what I'm saying. Everything. That. That's what I'm saying. That the, the the call to the traditional leaders to come on board is really a good one. No, no, but the, they I have am, always am, been there. Like Otum Four said, they don't have certain powers. Yes, but that's what I'm saying. They that, have a problem because some mm, of them are complicit mm, in it. They are involved. I'm saying, Ben, that we should give them this partnership, the needed power for it to to be effective. Look, we cannot ban you know, mining in its entirety. No, no but it, we, it, it's a source of yeah, revenue for us. We, we can't do see, that. But how we do it is the exactly. question. Exactly. What we should have done or what we should do now, I hope that those at the, at the uh, forefront of this fight will realize that we need to be specific with this fight. Mm. Let's say we are targeting the water bodies and their forest reserves mm. as our first part of this fight. Mm. Sanitize this area. Look, mm. when we are able to get rid of mining from our water bodies mm. and, and, uh, and forest reserves, we have, I'm sure we'll be like 95% through this fight. Because the rest of it, yeah, mm. the rest of it, which is like the underground mining, 
really is not it's not a major problem for us. Mm. Our biggest problem is, is the water body, which of course no law in Ghana has ever given anybody the mandate mm. to mine on the water body. So even that is illegal in the, in the first place. For the people who are doing it on the land, there are people who we have given licenses to who are also engaged in irresponsible and illegal mining. Mm. Let's go after those people. But I'm saying that let's target the river bodies and the forest reserves. And I'm sure, I'm, I tell you, we'll win this fight hands down. Why? And if we're doing why, everything why, together, we're we not going to go anywhere. Why I am not so optimistic. Mm. There's a trajectory. Okay. And today, as I share, you know, my blunt you, thoughts, I'll be getting point. into them. Okay. Itiwa, mm. what did we not say? Mm. But mm. we're still bent on going there for bauxite looking at the ecosystem and everything. Yeah. It's a forest reserve. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Sir John, we saw that he was willing out forest reserve mm. to his family. Mm. Now, another forest reserve in the Nimri Forest, mm. Samurai Boy, yeah. Western region. Mm. Someone is mining there. Yeah. Do, do you see the trajectory? Yeah. I am not enthused and I'm not optimistic. Mm. I, I want to see something beyond the rhetoric. You know why? The water bodies you speak of, yeah. According to even the most optimistic, you know, data or figures, if we stopped all Galamsey today on yeah. every water body, yeah. mm -hmm. stopped nothing, mm -hmm. it will take a hundred years yes. for the water bodies to go back to yes. some semblance of their natural state. But that's why we have to stop it today. And we are here. So, so I mean, the whole talk, we, I want to see the talk because mm -hmm. guess what? I am affected today, but I'm even thinking 10 years from now, mm. 20 years from now. 50 years from now, mm -hmm. what will those after us come to be? That is why I'm saying that we should have, we should have a target. And it's been a lot of talk up to this time. Mm -hmm. Now, now our, our water bodies are looking like beverage. Yes. You know? So, so, so if, if we're not if, careful, at some point, they'll, they'll move from Milo and start looking like Asana. If the authorities are listening, the truth is that if they really want to win this fight against Galamse, I'm saying... They should target the river bodies, the water bodies. And they should target the those forest. among them who are complicit, rather oh, exactly. than telling us that, exactly. oh, we, we, we will henceforth, if you are found, da, da, da. how about those who are found? And then again, what about the interventions we've done? We heard that we, we had bought some drones. Where are they? What are they being used for? The excavators that we seized, where are they? Um, so, so, I mean... We, we, we shouldn't be, see, if we are serious about this, this whole Galamse thing, eh, it shouldn't be that we touch here, we leave it, touch this, we leave it. We t no, no, no. We're not winning. Because the Galamse people, this is their, their, their blood. Oh. So they will do everything they can to have access to the gold. Exactly. You would have to also be ready to meet them wherever they will go. Last time I was telling someone that if we pretend that this is not a war, and would always want to do the usual things. We're not going to get any different results. Mm. If you want to get different results, you don't do things the same way. You have to do things differently. If they really understand the Galamse like I do, I've lived in a Galamse community before. Mm. I know how it is. Yeah. They shouldn't think that it's going to be a, something that will be on a silver platter. That's why we don't want it. Mm. It, it, go, it goes back to that saying, if you do what you've always done, you'll you get what you've no, always got. Exactly. Mm. So, so really... We need to change it. I, I really hope that tomorrow we'll hear that, look, now our operation is, we're going after those on the water bodies. Look. If no, but we've done that before. We haven't. Do you remember when they were shooting the Shang Fangs and all of that? We're and shooting. People were, oh, yeah. Well, when? When were we ah, shooting that? One of the operations that we, you saw military men, I mean, it was put on house TV house and all of us were clapping. Exactly my point. It's not that we haven't, you see, that's, that's so the whole just, point. Uh, but that's the point I mean. You see the bit you are talking about with drones, right? Are you saying that we are incapable? We are talking about drone technology to convey blood and all of that, to chips compounds and all mm -hmm. of that. Are you telling us, looking at the damage Galamse is doing to us, illegal mining, mm -hmm. that we cannot, as a country, mm -hmm. put funds, and, and mind you, we spent hundreds of millions on this Galamse thing, yeah, yeah, yeah. with practically nothing to show. The situation is worse. Yeah. Are you telling us we can't invest in drone technology? But, Hopefully, but not, what no, drones, no, what are they? No, I'm saying, Enough mm -hmm. to cover large swathes of the country, mm -hmm. different parts, where, targeted at different parts where Galamse is ongoing, up north, down south, middle belt, mm -hmm. and constantly ensure that these drones are patrolling so that when there's any activity, we get a tip off and, and we, are you telling us we are incapable of that? If we are not doing that, it's simply because that will is not there. Uh, it's not there. You see, we went around to, commit, we went around to um, uh, just uh, inaugurating district mining committees. What has come of, or what has become of them, really. Charlie, uh, sometimes when I look at this thing, I'm like, 
We are not it's so annoying we are. because some people yeah. either are directly benefiting, are engaged in it, or know people who are engaged in it. But we've seen and it's it. just a corner we, we the, the rest of us We have seen <clears> it. We have seen have been people, boxed into a corner. We have and a few people are actually mm. enjoying from the, the, the revenue of we gold have, in have, our own country. We have seen that people who are politically exposed are involved in this whole illegal mining menace. And that's why we have not been able <clears> to solve it. So Mr. President, if you are if you are watching or if anybody is watching who's who's uh, close to him, kindly. Um, let's double step the, our approach to this whole Galamse thing because if we don't, we'll regret it. Like, like Ben just alluded to the fact that even if we end Galamse on river bodies, it'll take 100 years. None of us now will be alive. Those who may be alive, just a handful of their kids who have been born. All of us yeah, young may man, be gone. Speak for yourself. Who knows? I could be a hundred. Oh, no, 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 no. Way hundred plus. Data does hey, not support. Do you know how long please, I will please, live? Please. Wait long. Do you know how long I will? Do you know what God can do? Are, are you going to, are you going to, uh, Genesis 18, 14, are you going to, is there anything impossible for God? But are you there, going there, to do shakara there, with God? There, there's nothing impossible Deji, for him, Deji. But he would ensure that you don't suffer. Oh, yes. This plus 100 will be 100 and... 100 and what, 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 and still no, fit. No, 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 no. Vim, Yazo, Karifi. Do you know Karifi? When the Hausa people say Karifi, do you know Karifi? Anyway. Galam say, eh? We don't have... No, we it. simply don't have the will. I've not seen this in any country at, at this level. Hmm. Where the, the level of destruction... Look, and with today, administration today, sitting today, down, today. and with their own members being complicit, and, and we talk about, we'll crack the whip, we'll crack the whip. What whip? There's no whip to be cracked. Today, someone sent me a message that, in a broad district of the Western region, you know, there's a river in my district called Butre. The source is from the Mpoho district. Some Chinese have taken a you, 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 you mean, you mean into, let, let me do some diabolical. You, into you mean Winston Amwes and Poho district? Exactly. Winston Amwes and Poho yeah. district. <laughs> I'll tease him, I mean, I'll tease him about this. Charlie, you see, sometimes you, you sit and you don't get the way we are as a country. Mm. And I also craved, uh, ask the people, for us, the citizens, let us, let us join this fight as well. See, in my community, when you come there to do Galamse, and we say no, it means no. Mm. But when we say yes, it means yes. Mm. Let us join. The politicians have failed us. But let us not sit there and say, if they don't do anything, we won't also do it. In our own small way, in our own small way, let's prevent it. Look, the, the excavators they take into the bush, we can stop them. I've been in communities where they've stopped gallant. The Some of these people from entering. You are aware mm. these people, mm -hmm. when they do their kululu, yeah. go around the system, mm. they come armed, heavily armed, and yeah. all of that. Sometimes people will tell you, we see that we want to do something, you even dare speak, and yeah. they are chasing you with bullets. As for that, yeah. will you risk your life? No, you wouldn't. You would expect that the, the state with its power, it is clothed with that power. Mm. My power, your power, our power, yeah. would use that power to deter them. But that's not what's happening. Sorry. The buck ultimately stops with the state. And, and one thing I want to say, let us, like the president said, let us take partisan politics out of this. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. What the... Galamse what, then, what, yeah. Galamse now, what, what Galamse as it will happen, mm is not in our national interest. Yeah. But my point is, the authorities that must work must sit must, up and do must, the must work. Do That's it. The president must, into must the really crack the whip. Mm -hmm. uh, ben, let, let's start with the Ghanaian Times. Paying compensation to all customers we can't pay. ECG to PRC. Mm. Uh, let's wage relentless fight against breast cancer. NTC managing director. Man 24 remanded for alleged murder of 70-year-old farmer. And BOG committed to financial inclusion agenda, first deputy governor says. Uh, let me bring this story about the fact that ECG says they can't uh, honor that directive by the PRC to pay customers for... And that's uh, an interesting uh, bit. <laughs> hmm. The electricity company of Ghana says it cannot undertake a wholesome compensation payment to all customers of the company as directed by the Public Utilities, um, Utilities Regulatory Commission, PRC, for the recent power crisis. Rather, the company noted it was prepared to abide by the laid-down procedure to pay compensation for affected customers on case-by-case -case basis. Managing Director of ECG, Samuel Dubek Mahama, said this, uh, his outfit was preparing to engage the PRC on the need to alter the directive to make case-by-case uh, -case the basis of payment of compensation. 
case by case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We look okay. at your case and then we... Good luck to them I in identifying do. the case by case. Mm -hmm. Of course, I'm sure they are looking at their losses. Mm -hmm. But you see, when it comes to dealing with people, I think sometimes that is the problem with public groupings, mm -hmm. right? Public entities. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a bit difficult for them on these. Private okay. enterprise often would look at, look, because it's private business. Yeah. People can leave you anytime. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to the public, you know, there's that leeway. No, but, that, but he, he the makes, masses he, are involved. He makes a point here. Mm -hmm. that Go ahead. A wholesome form of compensation to all customers would mean that those who did not suffer any form mm -hmm. of damage would be paid as well. What kind of da damage is he talking about? Because me leaving office and going around, I mean, I went to Aveno, I went to, uh, mm -hmm. what is it, Makola, mm -hmm. before I was directed to go to Tema. Yeah. And I even bust a tie on my way to Tema. Mm -hmm. So what damage? Is that the damage he's talking about? You know, it's a bit narrow in thinking. It could be that I wasn't affected. Honestly, I haven't topped up in, in a while. Okay. I, within this period, I've not gone to get any credits or something. I still have something left. Mm -hmm. But what if I wasn't affected in that way, but I was going to my favorite cold store, mm. and they were shut uh -huh. because of the same problem. Mm -hmm. And so I had to spend more money, go to other places. I mean, it may not be direct, but they may be indirect consequences of your actions mm -hmm. on me. Would you say that I've also not been affected? Well, I mean, if, if they tell us that, for example, look, looking at our economic situation right now, we're bleeding this and that and these, it, it may be more practical, but, mm -hmm. but to say that uh, we can't give it our mass because nobody, not, not everybody was affected is neither here nor there. But why should we pay you if you didn't suffer the, what, what we suffered? I hear... Have you seen the hikes in electricity tariffs? Uh -huh. Have you seen what, I mean, even comparatively, what we're paying even during the pandemic and what we're paying now so wouldn't and, agree, and the addition? Wouldn't you agree with him to say, let's do a case by case because you were not affected? That the case by case so scenario, we'll, we'll the case by case scenario. I was, is, I was affected. So then you look at look you. At you. You, 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 you're playing partisan politics oh, that, in this that, that, that is not partisan. You, you were not affected. Kojo politics versus Akaku politics. <laughs> that, is not, that is not fair. You were not affected, really, were you? you but were. I think, look, looking at some of the challenges we face mm -hmm. from time to time, it wouldn't yeah. be a big deal mm -hmm. for them to even show some goodwill. I think it's goodwill mm -hmm. to the people that, look, we did this, enjoy this. Ah, yeah. mm. Something minimal. Yeah. It's not, the people are not expecting anything big. Yeah. I think if you did something minimal, just mm -hmm. a show of goodwill, even if 10 CDs, something, yeah, small. Yeah, you know, something small, you know, something small, not, not anything, okay. you know, what has it? Anyway, um, now let's wage a relentless fight against breast cancer. Now, the managing director of the New Times Corporation, Mr. Martin Edu, who has advised the public to be tenacious and relentless in the fight against breast cancer. He, he says, and I quote, it is our collective and decisive resolve to fight breast cancer in all eight tendencies that would have positive impact on both present and future generations. Uh, yeah, Ben, so I, I'm sure you've seen that uh, isn't a news card from uh, Joy News making rounds that this month oh, yeah. you need to yeah. suck, su suck a breast to ensure why, that... Why were you, your lips were quivering when you were saying that? Yeah. Say that boldly. Oh, you need to... Uh, I mean, I... I, I is, <laughs> <laughs> you need to... <laughs> Oh, so so it's, it's, it's important. I mean, husbands would have to feel the breast of their wives to ensure that there, yeah. there are no lumps in them. Okay. And then... There's buy. a way of doing that, I guess. Yes, guess. yes. Okay. Do it and do it nicely. You know, Ayo. don't be too aggressive on it. Just okay. And then again, we are I being think advised... you are preaching to some people. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then we are being advised uh -huh. to, to suck the breast. Okay. To help the women. Uh -huh. So you need to suck your wife's breast. Okay. Uh -huh. I mean, this How about is, those who are not married? And then you are not part of it. Okay. Or right. thanks for the a friend clarity. of yours can ask for your services. Ah. Oh yes, yes. Oh sir. Oh yeah. I think I think so. If you have okay. a very close buddy, or oh. even your sister can ask you that. Your sister who's not married can ask you, Ben. Hey, kindly do this. S for sister me. dear, that's a dangerous level. Ah why? But your sister dear, your sister should even hey. be, be, be even. That, that be, could be incestuous. Oh, nah, sister, sister. Nah, uh, if it turns into oh, something your else. Your sister. Ah. Oh, sister ah. There's nothing that should attract. Have you have you not heard of incest? Well, I mean, no, 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 sister, dear, it's bordering on the, the but far, but, but friend, dear, the so, far end of the spectrum. No, but friend, it's okay. Uh, well, <laughs> they say there are friends with something, something. So I don't want to stray into that. But if, of course, this is highly restricted to married people. Yeah, take care of your partner, and and I think the favor should be returned because guess what? People don't realize this, but there is a small, you know, percentage, a minority group of men. Who also get breast cancer 
sometimes we forget that. Mm. So when it's pink October, think about the men as well. Uh, you see some men, uh, they have a bit of a fall. You understand? The, uh -huh, the gun people understand what I mean. So okay. they too need attention. I, I, I don't know. I think it's under 5% or something oh, of the sort okay. with the men. Oh, okay. But there is a group. Yes, uh, men can also get breast mm -hmm, really? cancer. Oh. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, uh, he says certain factors that increase risk of breast cancer are obesity, harmful use of alcohol, family history of breast cancer, history of radiation exposure, reproductive history, such as age that menstrual periods began and age at first pregnancy, tobacco use, and postmenopausal um, hormone therapy. So let's be watchful of those. Ben. All right, let's get into the Daily Graphic newspaper. Botiano Englishi Amanfo cries for roads, other developments. I, I, I want us to display the front page of the Daily Graphic if we have it. But just look at this. This is like a gully. Look there, where it's written page 17. Just look there. That is like a ditch, mm. a proper ditch. Yeah. And I've seen far worse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, th this is the state of our roads. Let me, let me get into uh, that, that, that. You know, page and read the story for you. And when we say these things, it's not out of any, you know, malice. When you've had a year of roads, three years back to back, and we have roads like this, that's, that's something. It is the last constituency in the Greater Accra region before entering the central region at Kaswa with a voter population of, guess what, 111,000 going by the 2020 general election. Botiano, English Amanfro constituency in the Gas South municipality, has been grappling with multiple developmental issues since its creation in 2012. Bordered by the Wejagbawe constituency to the east, Ewutu Senya East constituency to the western north, the Gumwa West, uh, the Gumwa East constituency to the western south area, and Domiabra Obum constituency to the north, this coastal constituency uh, covers Aplaku Botiano, Oshieye, uh, Kokrobite, Tuba, and parts of Wager. Now, in spite of challenges, the constituency is a beneficiary of two factories currently operating under government's one district, one factory policy. One of them, Ever Pure Ghana Limited, is sited at Tomefa in English Amanfu. The factory produces sachet and bottled water. The other factory established to produce diapers, known as Sunda International, is located at Dunkona. And with this, you know, nature of roads, do you, do you know what that is going to do even to the industries that you want to set up? Mm -hmm in terms of conveying their products, in terms of manufacturing, in terms of accessing raw material, I rest my case. <laughs> yeah, anytime I think about roads, mm. and I, I go as far back as the basic school, when we were told that some of the challenges confronting agriculture was poor road network, I'm like, ish. So why are we always... In this day and age. <laughs> we're always about road networks. Okay. There's also first after trade in Ghana tiles yeah. Rwanda goods take lead. Mm -hmm. And Ghana has issued its first certificate of full commercial trading to a ceramic tiles production company to export its products under the African Continental Free Trade Area Guided Trade Initiative. In the same vein, uh, the Customs Division of the Ghana Revenue Authority has received the first consignment of goods under the initiative from Rwanda with delivery already done. The Assistant Commissioner of Customs in charge of the AFTA Secretariat, FY Akutu, who made this known in an interview with the Daily Graphic in Accra yesterday, said on September 30 this year, the Customs Division issued the Certificate of Trading to a tiles manufacturing uh, company, Keda yeah. Ghana Ceramics Company Limited, yeah. located at Shama yeah. in the Western region, to export a consignment of its products to Cameroon. Mm -hmm. uh, he further indicated that a second Ghana-based company, the Benso Oil Palm Plantation, we know of it, yeah. at Edum Benso, yeah. also in the best, uh, western region, was expected to export palm kennel oil to Kenya in due course. Yeah. Great strides yeah, as far yeah. as that. I mean, I don't feel we've done enough with the yeah. AFTA, especially having the Secretariat mm -hmm. here, but at least this is a, a good start. start yeah. Very, it's very good start. start. And I'm told that Ghana will also be receiving approved goods from participating state parties as well. Right. So let's see how this is. This is good. It opens up the market. And see, I always say that when we collaborate, there's a lot we can do together. So this is really a, a, good, a good step that we're taking. Let, All right. I hope that it, it goes well for Two you. quick stories to wrap. Use your powers to check executive N NMC chair challenges parliament. Story on page 16. Also on page 16, graphic tertiary business sense challenge. KNUSD crowned 2022 champions. Let me just take In what? Uh, snippets. Uh, Graphic Tertiary Business Sense uh, Challenge. Oh, okay. All right. So 
The Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology has emerged winners of the Graphic Tertiary Business Sense Challenge uh, version 4.0. The university, was, which, which was appearing in the finals of the competition for the second time in a row, convincingly beat uh, two-time champions, the University of Cape Coast and maiden finalists, the University for Professional Studies, Accra, in a heated contest held at the National Theatre in Accra yesterday. Of course, uh, in the other story, Yaobwedu Ayebwafo, the chairman of the NMC, has urged Parliament to exert its powers to check the executive arm of government. On the back page, Koenigsdorfer chasing dream World Cup spot. I'm talking about right-winger plying his trade with hamburger SV and uh, his senior career he's also been with Dynamo Dresden uh, and he wants to play Ransford Yabua Koenigsdorfer uh, and he wants to don the red gold green black of the black stars okay anyway. now in the finder um, it says 1801 killed in crashes in nine months uh, provisional data compiled by the Motor Traffic and Transport Department of the Ghana Police Service shows that the number of commuters killed in road traffic crashes recorded in the first nine months of 2022 declined by 17.08% compared to the same period of 2021. That's good news there. Oh. But still some people are, are dying, so we need to do more. Uh, the fact that it has declined by 17.08% is good, but we need to do more. But there's also an interesting article in the finder, it says how some health professionals are killing patients in Ghana by Felix Kwame Kweino. Um, I mean, he addresses how health professionals are needlessly, you know, killing patients in Ghana. And this thing has been on the table for quite some time. Right. And I hope that we will address it. It looks like we, have, we are not doing much when it comes to addressing uh, these whole issues about uh, health professionals and how they treat a uh, patient. But this will be the two interesting stories that I, I picked from the Finder newspaper today. Let's get into some quick stories as well. Uh, Daily Guide newspaper, Bank of Ghana hikes policy rate to 24.5%. NBC adopts Momo uh, payments, story on page three. Uh -huh. Police bust toddler abuser. I'll be getting into that story. Arrest Galamse, Kingpings, or Jia Hoho, Yao Jibi. Uh, President of the National House of Chiefs uh, mm -hmm. says so, and government to pay Idra victims 1.2 million. So let me focus on uh, those two stories. The Office of the Attorney General and recently the Kaka family, you know, yeah, had yeah. cause yeah. to talk about the delay mm -hmm. in the legal processes I mean, and they, all they of have that. A, a news conference on exactly. Wednesday. And and I think is it Ed, one of the family mm -hmm. members who supposedly was uh, a suspect, still. How long? A year plus mm. and nothing to show. Mm. The Office of the Attorney General has recommended a total of 1.2 uh, million Ghana CDs as compensation to the three victims who suffered various degrees of injury in the Adra shooting incident that occurred at area in the Ashanti region in June last year. A source close to the issue has disclosed uh, to the Daily Guide that the AG and Minister of Justice, Godfrey Abouadami, on July 22, 2022, wrote to the Minister of Interior, Ambrose Derry, to make the payments to the victims by setting out the basis and formula for the pavement. We await seeing what happens in that respect. But, <clears throat> page six, police bust toddler abuser. I'm sure you've seen the video. Yeah, 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 very shocking one. A man at Akabwim mm. in the Jasikan district of the OT region has been arrested by the police investigating allegations of recent child abuse captured in a video that went viral on social media. Richard Kofi was picked up in the community at about 3.30 p.m. on Wednesday. The fourth estate reported yesterday and added that the wife of the child abuser was also arrested. Finally, earlier the police denied having arrested the suspect, asserting that they were following a number of leads as part of the ongoing investigation to track down the individual. Uh, but now that has happened. Meanwhile, the Ministry of Gender, Children and Social Protection has condemned the brutal assault of the toddler, <clears throat> describing the action as cruel, inhumane, and a barbaric act meted out to the child. Barbaric doesn't even suffice in describing, you know, the, 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 this whole thing. It, it just, it just, it, it was crazy. And in the entertainment page, all my friends... His, his head should be checked. Uh, well, sometimes we use that as an excuse, but I agree. It must also be checked to find out how mentally stable he is. Because it was just, you would think he, he, he was fighting with an adult. Even, even if you were fighting with an adult and you had more strength. This final one on entertainment. All my friends deserted me. Daddy Lumba. Oh. He's been speaking. DL. And he says in his moment of trial, especially when he was not well, mm. Charlie. Anyway, back to you. 
Well, uh, the Ghanaian publisher, the editorial says, fighting the environmental terrorist. Yeah, that's what wrote... Elizabeth Va describes yeah. this as. Environmental terrorism. I've always said that's how we should see it. Mm. If we see it that way, that's how we can win. Look, well, anyway. Um, it says, parochial interest out. And I hope that... Uh, now, let me read a, a bit of it. It says, President Kufuado this week met with chiefs, traditional rulers, and all stakeholders in the fight against Galamse. The meeting primarily is to take the Galamse fight a notch higher, even as the country strives to find a lasting solution to this national problem. But the editorial is cautioning the, that all those who have vested interest in Galamse must be dealt with. And mm. I hope that those in charge will read this and ensure the right things are done. People who are known to be involved in this should be punished. Mm. They shouldn't be treated with kids' gloves. It, it, it doesn't help the fight. Mm. But I, I think that's what really caught my attention. They also talk about the Galamse fight and that President Kofuado is telling the chiefs to, uh, to help in protecting our heritage. Let's see how that goes. But again, we are proud as, uh, as teachers, but not our work condition. <laughs> okay. Nat is speaking. So Nat says that they are proud to be teachers. You know, this week we had the World uh, te teacher, teacher Day. And they are proud to be teachers, but their working conditions are so mm. bad that they want government to do mm. something about. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, I think, I think this would be all from it for me. Uh, uh, NDC throws Galamse challenge at Akofa. Well, uh, <laughs> that's something I've said we shouldn't do. So um, I, I hope that we would limit, you know, the, the whole politicization of this particular fight. But Ben, as we go... But we also cannot say that any time a political actor speaks, it is politics. There's the national interest, there's a political interest. If someone is speaking the truth and it is the way to go, where do we delineate what is national interest and political interest? Do you get it? But, so we but, shouldn't play the politics of maybe we did this and you did that. It should yeah. be, look, this is a national problem. Let's do this. Let's yeah, but, face the But facts. that's where when you come out to say that, they also, they also go out to point, they'll point it out to you that, oh, during your time this happened, you know that, you, you know and, that, and that is the former, problem. Exactly. But you know that former President Mahama has said that when he comes, he'll give amnesty to Ghanaians who have been arrested for engaging in Galamse. Mm. You are aware. Yes, so, but, so, but, but, but so, that, that, that was said in a certain context. I've seen people throwing no, that so around. I'm saying, I'm saying that, Ben. And, and the when context you, is very when important. You, when you bring that up, the other party will also tell you that. He also said this, you know. Well, so that's what I'm saying that, look, that thing that Sami Jeffy did yesterday is good, but they could have also given it to a civil society to have done it. Right. It would have conveyed the same message. Without their coming Exactly. In. I get the point. Yeah. But I'm saying that we should mm -hmm. just detach ourselves from the politics and do what is right for Mother Ghana in the end. It, it is difficult for the, the mm. political actors. Mm. For us, it won't be any difficulty, but they well, will bring it up. Let's wrap with Republic Press. AMA to roll out community-based solid waste uh, separation and compost projects in Accra. NBC muddies Galamse waters. That is how <laughs> Republic Press uh, captures the story. Man saves Nigerian lady from ritual murders. And NPP grassroots celebrate Alan Cash. Two stories I'll quickly, very quickly look at. Martin Amidu wades into IMF convo. Uh -huh. And according to the special prosecutor, government is scheming, his words, uh, to use the, the, the IMF as a smoke screen to dump an austerity budget yeah. on Ghanaian citizens. Yeah. That is what we, we, we give the thinks. details on, on uh, Newsnight on yeah. Joy FM. And, and then uh, men sucking breasts. I have to go to this. Yeah. Men sucking breasts cannot prevent breast oh. cancer. Okay. So a surgeon at the Kolebu Teaching Hospital, Dr. Joel My Love Emisa, uh, Emisa has okay. debunked claims that sucking breasts can prevent breast cancer. According to her, it is breastfeeding that can prevent breast cancer and not breast Sucking oh, okay. by men. Okay. So, uh, uh, I didn't know this. Burying thinking I didn't, I didn't on know this. this. I guess I can't tell you. No, no, no. For those take of it us, easy. Take no, it easy. For those of us who are married, we are okay. I mean, doctor will agree that we are okay. My, my wife is not breastfeeding now, so I would have to provide that, that service. I would have to turn myself into the baby. To breastfeed. Provide the service. As and though you were way so, Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just because. Hmm. Uh, so, so that's it. Uh, if, if your wife is listening, uh, we greet you. Oh, oh she what, is. What's her name? She's, what's her name? She's Abigail. 
Abigail. Abigail Abna Ampansa Brace. Uh, I like the way you pronounce the name. Uh, yeah. A lot of people butcher that name. They go Abigail. Nah. Uh, Abby Boy. Abigail. Abigail. Abna Abigail. Ampansa Brace. Oh, a lovely a name. Solid young lady. Uh, good morning to you, uh, Abigail. Uh, Kojo, Kojo has good plans uh, yeah. for you, oh, I mean, especially in this month of October. Not tonight, tonight I'm going home, so really, yeah. Uh, After yeah. Prime, I'll, I'll go out. You'll go and deliver, you know. No, I'm going to the children. Services. I'm not going to her, I'm going to the children. Ah, but of course she's home, so yeah. It's, a, it's an added advantage to do it, traveling. Anyway, <laughs> so we'll be bringing you sports <laughs> shortly, but look out for my blunt thoughts titled Losing from Both Ends mm. Our Natural Resources in Crisis and Our Economy in Tatters. But sports now, Muftao Nabila Abdullah engages Gifty Owari. Uh, on what exactly? the Women's Premier League, and, in fact, it's coming off. So what can we expect? Razak Mizbao actually has that interaction. Do stay with us. Hello, welcome to another edition of today's show and uh, with me, Razak Musbao. Today we are shifting the attention a bit to women's football and uh, we're going to take a look at the Women's Premier League because it's starting in October next month and uh, it has a sponsor now, Mota Guinness, that uh, has been a long way coming and we'll try and look at how especially the sponsorship is going to impact the performance and the uh, whole management of, of the women's club in the country. And we'll talk about Berry Ladies because uh, is the Chief Executive Officer of Berry Ladies that we're having a conversation with, Miss Gifty Owari Mens, a very, very astute person, highly respected person in the political space and also in the sports uh, ecosystem. And uh, Miss Gifty, thank you so much for receiving us in your office. Thank you too. Well, it's a very nice place. Uh, saw some of your designs, some of the artworks particularly the one with the pencil. I'm sure we cannot see, the viewers cannot see it, but that's a very nice work, nice one there. You have a nice office here. Some few weeks ago, uh, the GFA announced the Malta Guinness is coming to give you money. Yeah. I heard it's about $250,000. How much are you getting? <laughs> we, we as CEOs are yet to have a meeting to finalize on what the figures will be. What does it mean uh, for women's football? It's huge, you know, it's, it's beautiful to know that now it's no more going to be called just the Women Premier League, but then Malta Guinness Women Premier League. At least it makes you understand that now brands are beginning to associate with women football, which used not to be so. And that's, that on its own is very exciting. If all we're even going to get was even going to drink Malta Guinness, I think it was going to be beautiful. But then again, at least now we know that they have placed in money to be able to give back to the women club. GFA has come out a few times to tell us some of the things they're going to use the money for, which I think is fair, on training the people, because the people that are in the game need a lot of training. And whether we like it or not, Ghana's Premier League is not, even from the mill to wherever, it's not being taken like it's supposed to be. We, we, we do more of just selections and other things that are not really helping the game. But then we are trying to get the world class where now we have us at Toko playing for Champions League and we want to see it better and better and better again. So yes, we would need all of these things to come in. Now some money is coming in means relief on financiers of these teams because though they were not being given money still, you have to spend on the girls. And there are all rules that you have to still pay them. So how do you pay them? For, from whose money do you pay them? And then when you as an individual is trying to go for sponsorship, it's not that easy. But then if it, if it becomes that broader scope of a brand name, then it's easier because you can now say, oh, Motor Guinness is associated with it. So you can also come on board, which makes it better. So I think that, yeah, we're going to have it. I mean, what do you think the, the women's, uh, the women's, various women clubs in the country really did to attract this kind of sponsorship? Because that, that was one of my curiosity. Why did Motor Guinness, what did, what did Berry ladies, Azaka's ladies and all the others do which Malta Guinness sat and was like, no, this is getting exciting and we have to get on board. 
Brandon. Mm. Um, that, that, that has been like the wow factor now. That was our wow factor because if you check how it's been, for instance, because twice we've had women clubs being, for instance, nominated for best social media branding of the year and other things, which had never happened. We have CEOs come out to co compete with the Kotokos and the Haas and all that. Your nomination? Yeah, right. And it, it had never happened before because women football was very young. And if you check, even on the GFA platforms, when they are playing and you check even on social media, the eyes that are watching the women football, sometimes it's intriguing more than the male. When you check our stadiums now, people come in toward them. Though we may not be charging, there was still no factor that excited them to come in. But now things are changing. People are beginning to appreciate it. Now we are, we are bringing the old time strength of football. And we're way back, before even Asante Kotoko would play any game, you would realize that there were this acrobatics, there were things that happened which I think women football started putting in for people to get excited. So I may not come there really to watch just the match. I would want to come there to just see how some aerobics are, teams are doing. And that has excites me to want to just stay and say, okay, can I just see what those girls are doing? And before I know, I have stayed for the whole 90 minutes. And that keeps happening, which I think that Malta Guinness as a brand that is connected to the everyday person needed and younger people are also getting more interested in the women's league because when you realize even on social media the followership those girls are getting the kind of marketing they are getting is also beginning to get us up there that hey the women football can do something talking about next season money is coming in uh, what are the other things that you think needs to be done to raise the women's game particularly improve uh, spectatorship and uh, a few other things relative to performance and, and the others. What do you think needs to be done to improve the game from the club side, from GFA side and even maybe from the media side? I, I think from us as club owners and CEOs of clubs, one of the things we are supposed to particularly do is to appreciate what the game is and then put in our best. And when I talk of best, often it's not about the money, it's about the prepping of these girls, how discipline will come out, how we we'll position them, and then the impressions we give out there. Sometimes, even when a CEO is called even for interviews and other things, we decide to decline, not because we don't want to, but we feel like, okay, what are we gaining out of all of this? So when we understand that the game has its own contributions, we also have to bring on board. Then I think we can do better. GFE may have to look at it from the broader side of the disciplinary committee is now making sure that referees do not misbehave because really, for instance, we played Hazakas and then with Barry Hazakas, when a referee did more than 10 minutes additional, additional time, mm -hmm. all the punishment was some four band league. Mm -hmm. So four band matches, how much is a person gaining out of all of this? But if I say that I'm banning you the whole of the season, then you know that you've lost something, then this person cannot even go from Ghana to talking about punishment. Very, because it, the, the beauty of the game is destroyed when people take advantage of the game. Because mm -hmm. if I'm playing and I have wasted so much time, and everybody knows that when it was 90 minutes, 95 minutes, very ladies had won the match. And then if somebody says that no, it has to equalize, so whether you like it or not, I'm going to play till you equalize. Mm -hmm. Really. And these things also deter the teams from acting well, and it happened to a lot of teams because they sat on many, many other ones. Now, one of the things that the media also do that affect us is anytime there is a challenge with the women team, you hit on us like never before. Because see, things had happened, there's been issues with all these male clubs. Sometimes the media are subtle because they are sometimes afraid of how the male supporters will come at them. But then again, when I think when it happened at the, was at the, McDonald Park or something, when one of the teams misbehaved during the Super Cup, which I happened to be vice chair of the committee. And I remember how the media picked it up and then for almost a week, it was just the talk of the day, like punish the player. Nobody was looking at even the details of what really had happened. Where, how much strength somebody feels, because yes, a, a player must be disciplined, but then how, to what extent will my discipline stay? When so much Barry was playing, all we saw was that after additional five minutes is added, additional five minutes is also added again. After the 10 minutes, don't you think that a player would just be, it would be rational for a player to want to react? And after the player reacts, someone would not just look at what might have made the player react, but the media were like, the players are indisciplined, they should be banned. Nobody was looking at what really had happened. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, it was the bad thing. It took 
all the beautiful game we're having, all the Super Cup excitement, all we spoke about was the indiscipline side. So there's issues like officiating that needs to be looked at. There's so, issue about reportage yes. where media need to be circumspect media about it. Media one of the biggest, mm. the biggest deterrent for us as a women's club team because sometimes when the media is discussing us, how they even rubbish it. I've, I've, I've listened to a media house discuss women say, "Oh, a man there some do and then then and I was very amazed that this is someone who had who really started covering women football somewhere in the early 2000s. Not male football, and all of a sudden today, because he feels he has some viewership, he says that yeah, he should focus on the Chelsea's and the Arsenal's and the Man U's and forget about. That's that's the thing about the perception about the women's game. I mean, a lot of people still think you know this is just for fun. There's, they don't get to see like the way you approach Berry Ladies is a business, and the other clubs is a business, and they approach it with that mindset. For a lot of the fans, the perception is still that oh, they're just having fun. I mean, they seem not to have come to terms that women's game, women's football, is real business? It would, the, the, the charity they say begins at home, it starts with our media, because who takes it to the public is the media. Now, it, it's about how you discuss us. For instance, this season, Barry has been able to tra done so many transfers into the of our girls. Now, how many times did the media even discuss transfers that had come up? There's been the biggest transfer, which is a 300,000, being done for the first time in the history of women football. How many of the media people have sat to discuss it? But it, 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 no, but when, when there is a transfer of Lionel Messi, they don't share it with you, but you still talk about it. So this is an international transfer that was done back for a South African mm -hmm. till this time. I had not had a single media house discuss it. Opening up and but it was not my team. This is, like I said, nobody in Ghana owes Udinese. Nobody in Ghana owes Real Madrid. Nobody in Ghana owes Kaka. But why is it that when Kaka is transferred, it becomes news in Ghana? Because you fish for them. Now, when there was, and this is like the biggest thing to happen to the women's football, that for the first time we had a transfer of $300,000. Till this time, I keep trying to read on portals from Ghana. If a single individual is, we were able to send someone like a girl out from Abakan out of Ghana to Semba ladies. Till this time, it was all over our social media platforms. Not even a single social, even on your social media handles, did any of you pick up to say, "Hey, congrats to Berry ladies for being able to do a transfer to Semba ladies where she's going to play." No. And all of these things affect, Hazakas keep transferring girls, nobody speaks about them. So it's just a point of they building their own brand and other things. But if any of them had slapped someone, it would have been the news. Why? So unless the media helps us to be able to say that, see, now women football is now business. Women football is moving from it being just excitement and some girl wanting to play. But then the girl appreciating that I don't want to be a man. I want to do my football, but I'm doing it as my profession. And these girls are beginning to be professionals. Then we will just be where we are. Because the more you push us out there, the more we are sold out there. See, we went into Wafu, and Pemdakwa did marvelously well. But why? Why were we stopped? Because the team we played, which is Rivers, that the Bayosa people had so much that to the extent that they had, their winning bonuses were running on. Two hundred and three hundred dollars. Now, if I'm playing with a girl who has a two hundred or three hundred dollar as a winning bonus, and I'm going to give my young ladies, let's say, a hundred Ghana CD as a win, you think which of them is going to play better? Someone is going to be given as much as a three thousand Ghana CD for winning a single match. Yeah, so the motivation and why is it not there? Because even the media to be able to push us out there. So if I go to a brand, the brand is going to say, OK, cool. I heard of this thing on Joy FM. I heard of this thing on Adam FM. I heard of this thing on Joy TV. It's not there. So until the media says, see, we're going to collaborate well, tell us when your match days are. Tell us your training times. Give us some slot. Let's speak about it. I think it's only your station that's doing better than all of them, having like a, a how do you call it, a program that even talks about women football. That talks about even that one. Sometimes you realize that the, it, it becomes an excitement where the women's football begin to talk about men's more. So we just have to look at it again, where we say that holistically as a nation, we are giving more playing time, more air time for these women football things to be discussed. If not, we're going to be there because my first match, which is supposed to be Barry's first match, is with Hazakis. 
Now it's going to be like there. <laughs> the big game. Yeah. And obviously the biggest game of all the yes, yes. matches we, we keep playing. We're definitely going to come and look at that. But I think also one of the things that a lot of the uh, the women clubs need to mm. consider is the organization of their clubs. Mm. You know, you need. To, I think the clubs need to be well structured. It's important to have not just maybe a spokesperson or a media officer. You need to have a proper public relations person mm. who can really establish that relationship with the media mm. and leverage on whatever contacts they have to push your brand out there. Mm. Because for a lot of the male class, for instance, we don't necessarily go to them for the stories. They, they push it to you, oh, I've done this, you publish yeah. it, I've done this, you publish it. So I think that's the side that some of the female teams need to look at. You are getting yeah, because for some of them, I think they feel that, oh, it's not anything. If they don't, if they don't talk about them, it's not anything. Or like they do a transfer. As I can, they feel it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's sometimes not scared awesome. to tell you the stories because the world is the positive. One day you oh, yeah. pull the negative out. Yeah, I think so because, yeah. for instance, last somewhere last week, like at Ben, we had a strategic. whole strategic yeah. Yeah, session, yeah. and then yeah. a lot of things come up, and mm. you realize that hey, that sometimes you need this kind of conversations mm. to come out and then speak mm. about it. Yeah, mm. great, 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 great. So, I mean, finally, let's wrap up on the women's. Mm. Come next season, mm. what are you expecting in terms of the women's Premier League? I think now that we have uh, at least a league sponsor, we're going to have more fun. Mm -hmm. it's, it's for us at Berry, we are trying to do more restructuring. Mm -hmm. We are trying to make people appreciate the game. So we may end up being maybe really the first, we've been the first team, I think, to be able to fully have our fan base registered and mm -hmm. be able to connect with them just as for free, tag them, and trying to bring more excitement to the game and then making the fans part of the game because mm. we realize that they are the main stakeholders. If they get involved in the game, mm. other brands will want to be associated with but brands wants people. Mm. And it's the eyes they are looking for, mm. so which we are doing. And for us, the, this year's league is supposed to be more very a nostalgic one because mm. it, it connects with the black, what do you call it, the black stars going for the World Cup. Yeah, yeah. So there's going to be some few breaks which would give the girls some, some time to, of relief to rest, but then mm. again, it will affect us. Because for women, when you break them, you have to, yeah. bringing them back is a yeah. little difficult, but we'll have to do it. Mm. Uh, I think uh, most of our first times, first leg is going to be our away matches, mm. which most of the time, every I think owners like because mm. at that time when they finish their way matches, the strength mm. begins to dwindle, and that's mm. when they are coming home, mm. and their fan base are going to protect mm. them. So you'll expect yeah. so much excitement this season. This, this, this season is going to be more exciting mm. because Max TV is also picking us up every yeah. time, and and then I think that we are going to we are, for us we are doing new jerseys. We are we are doing our jerseys by close of week. Mm. God willing, and then we we have many other fun stuff. We're gonna we'll talk about very ladies. We'll spend some more time to talk about very ladies. And then my and first match with Hazakis, I I think we've done it before. We've gone mm. there to win. We won them on our platform. We've gone there. They know we won, mm. and then referee decided otherwise. And then <laughs> just as that, now that we are going in there, is that mm. clarity? But we've already spoken. And I keep telling Anna and Basigi that see, no matter what. We'll ship them for everybody to know, yes. Interesting. We've on that been, note, we've, uh, been, we've been on there ever since we came. Oh dear. We'll talk more about Berry Ladies. Uh, we're going to have uh, some a uh, little more discussion about it to understand what they are doing because uh, they, they, they are, a lot of people describe them as the model women's football club in the country and I think that's something very profound and we're going to try and get some uh, details about that, what they are doing. The, the, they had some strategic session uh, some few days ago and we want to know what it is coming. Mm. One of my curiosity was Barry, that, that name was like, why Barry? Why, why did you, of all the names, he chose Barry Ladies. It used to be Halifax Ladies, then Barry Ladies. First of all, uh, I mean, Halifax Ladies, how did you come about acquiring the club? And why Barry Ladies? Right, so it was, it was, it was uh, so Halifax, we all know of Halifax, which used to be at Nungwa. <clears throat> they were doing well, quite well, but they had their own issues. We decided to, it, it started like a social responsibility mm. of what can we give back to the society. Okay. And I have done football before myself. I had played football before. Played football yes, when I was in Ken University. Okay. Right. Okay. So oh, I. Wait, what position I could, were you scoring? No, 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 I was not. <laughs> I, I was a midfielder. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I had, I had played before, looking at it from all of that. I, I felt it was something we could give back. Mm -hmm. So in giving back, we decided to acquire Barry. So it started with Sami and Nimado having the conversation and saying, hey, can't we just own a club? And then we, we, we wanted to 
start from the scratch, you realize that, okay, Halifax wanted to trade. So one of our assistant coaches got to us and said, oh, they want to sell it, so why don't you guys come purchase? And then we got it. Now every club had gone through some processes and then when you pick it up, you're just supposed to and appreciate what can I do with the club. Mm -hmm. Now, berry because of three things. One, berry, the fruit berry is the only fruit in the world that is eaten all out. So you eat every part of berry. Okay. Tomatoes is a berry, mm -hmm. all the other berries we know. So you, t you chew every part of it. And anywhere a berry seed drops, it also grows again. Okay. So you don't, you don't struggle to grow berries. And then the berry color, you know, every berry is beautiful. It has like it's so colorful. Now, then again, there is a town in Australia called Berry, And that town, one of the things the town is profound for is that to not make any royal, which is the England royals, sad. The town must from 1st January to 31st of December have events. So anytime the royals are sad, mm -hmm. they can fly to Australia to enjoy. Wow. And then looking at that, we say, okay, so, all of these resonates with us. We want to be more colorful. We want to come out there and be able to be useful to those young ladies right from in and out and not have any blockade in their lives. That people should come with us on Barry, whether you are a technical member or you are a playing buddy and think that after football, what's next for me? So we give him back to them, not just on the field, but also off the pitch. That was the idea. And then we have our colors, the pink. We have, you know, when you check our colors, we have something that is more of the baby pink. We have the mauve and then deep violet. The whole idea was to bring out that kind of thing. And these colors are colors you have to use all the primary colors to be able to get them out. So the excitement was to bring these out. And our logo has the six posts in. And that is very spiritual, too, because we are Christians. And then as owners, we're looking at at what point did God create the human being. So we, we, we did a lot of sitting down to be able to draw even our logos. A lot of people, you know, and then it was about sustainability. and. You know, when any time anybody is associated with Nana Kwame Nketiah, Bekum Chelsea, because I happen to be a shareholder of Bekum Chelsea, and if you get associated with him, you realize that you begin to love to appreciate the spirituality of things and not just look at things from just the surface of it. So we had to do a lot of thinking through myself and him, and then we decided to come up with the whole logo which meant so much and dear to me. So any time I'm even angry at my own team, I look back at the logo and say, hey, this is what you made. And so far it's been beautiful. We decided to also rebrand women football and not make the woman feel like a man, mm -hmm. but rather be the feminine she's supposed to be. So after, right after the pitch, she still feels like a woman. When she's coming, before she enters the pitch, she is a woman. Because one of the challenges women football had been having was people did not want their women to play football because they want to see their mothers, they want to see their aunties in them, they want to see their sisters in them. They don't want to see some tomboyish in them. So we just had to tweak it. So we decided to put discipline in, try to change the perception. So if you check the kind of things we wear on the field, they are feminine. Any of our jerseys, our track suiting, anything the girls do, we don't do terrible haircuts. We try to be very disciplined. There is no way a berry player would ever abuse a referee, never. Because you, you, it's not about being sidelined by, uh, being punished by GF or anything. At Berry, we'll punish you. And these are the principles we wanted to. When we are coming in, they have a clubhouse. You're supposed to stay there. We have hours of taking phones, doing this, doing that. Things that makes you know that you are a real human being mm -hmm. and not some footballer who is supposed to be a rascal because it's gone. Gone were the days when they said rascals play. Now we have people who are still going to school, who are very educated. We've had some of our students completing unis and done their national service. We've had some of them going abroad like Nina and Co at Baltimore to play and then making sure that these girls do not leave school. So Constance is still in, stu in school. We had to make sure she was finishing to continue. And that is what we believe. If you cannot go to school, we know that, okay, what is the basic thing you can do? You can do a craft. So how can we help you to fix all of these things? Our Wait, other people too. Crafts, yes. Yeah, beyond the pitch. Yeah, because, because be whether we like it or not, women after some time will have to stop playing. Mm -hmm. Now, they are not being paid all the big monies, the Samojans and the rest were paid. Yeah. So when they leave the pitch, what can they call themselves at? Will they be able to say, for instance, today, if, I, if any of them say they don't want to play, if Porsche Asante, our, ref our goalkeeper, one of our goalkeepers says she won't, don't want to play again, mm -hmm. she is a graduate, she's done her service, she can get a job. 
If she decides to do sports, then she can become whatever she wants to do in sports, whether a referee, whether any technical she wants to do. And then our general captain, for instance, who is now growing, is someone we are trying to move from being a player into a coaching point because she has a strength too. We have, for instance, one of our assistant coaches used to be a player, Rhoda, and now she is a coach. So for us, we do transition. We, we, we do not think that after they are done, bye bye, and then you go away. No, they have to find themselves in the game because that is a game they love and the passion must be translated into something beautiful for them. And that's what we very behave. The reason why we had all these strategic sessions is to make sure that at any point in time as a club, there are things that become your setbacks. So after two seasons of being in and we just have to set back to see, see what can we do better? What can we restructure? What can we get to make everybody happy? And then we see ourselves as a family and not just a football club. Because we want to, for the next 10 years, for the next 20 years, people that are playing to say that, see, I owe at least 1% shares of Barry. It shouldn't just be a point of gifty or gifty's family. It should look at it from the percept that holistic approach of everybody feeling I am part of it. And that's what Barry is growing so to be. The relationship with the fans, because uh, that's one thing that uh, you have distinguished yourself mm -hmm. at um, registering fans and making sure you even... Because I think uh, I, have, I have quite a number of friends on, on Facebook, and when you had your session, your strategic session, it was all over my timeline. Mm -hmm. Bury this, bury that, bury that, mm -hmm. everywhere I was going. I mean, talk to me about your relationship with your fans and what it is that you've done to attract the kind of followership you've you have. All right, it would amaze you to know that even our head coach, huh? so Macy Tego would go to the stand even before we would get the fans their chess for free because we realized that you have to attract them to come because women football, like the meal, were not, you're not able to trade your jerseys. Now, she could even go to the stand of doing shirts for them. We, we make them so much part of the decisions that there are times a coach would have even conversations with them because some of them come to watch our playing time, our training sessions, and they even know which player is good and which player is not. And when fans are sitting back and they say, no, 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 coach, this player, next week, please don't play this group player. You would have to find a way of appeasing them. So all of these things had come and then you'd be amazed that we've had times where players are not well and then fans just said players are not well and then they move their motors and other hospitals the place is full because they want to see how the our stars are doing wow. and these is the relationship we have with them we play in Medina where people love sports and they come out to do the sports so we connect with them at places we are supposed to connect with them we connect with the mosque we connect with the people that live in Medina so it's we are there and they are us and then we don't make the players feel different from the people and any time that our technical team are there they, they try to merge up with them they try to have conversation so yes they have concerns which they see too because not all teams would want to listen to you have a concern i'm the one spending you don't spend what, what's your concern but we decide to listen we decide to get closer to them and make them hover around us that's why really we are all over the place and the, this is madina is a place where you can get very properly structured teams and groups and people that decide themselves. So when they come with you, it's like having a whole battalion follow you. Amazing. Now let's talk about next season because you are a bit about winning the league next season yeah. and even going to Africa. Mm -hmm. How do you intend achieving that? But even before that, let's talk about last season. You played seventh. Mm -hmm. That was not a good performance. I was losing one of your numbers. You won just four games, do ten of them. Yeah. But what happened last season? What, did you, what lessons do you take from last season? Last season, uh, there were problems with us for very known reason. Our coaches had so much national assignments that we, we ended up having less coach player inf interfacing time because almost all the time Messi was out of the country. We had, at one point, we had loaned a lot of our players also out for other assignments that the, there were moments that you'd be amazed that we had to, we had just about sometimes 13 players and we had to still go play. Mm -hmm. We had most of our players, our senior players also at the various national team collapse and it, was, it also affected us a lot. So this season I think we are doing more of the homing, we are not doing more outs to be able to structure back and obvious. You know even when we had all of these setbacks, we still had to do more draws yeah. than lost. Yeah. And the, the draws were just, like I said, 
because the, 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 we had given so much out mm. to the country, had given so much out to other clubs that it affected us. So this year, we are, we are restructuring, we are not doing most of them. We are rather, so there are some clubs that are still seeking for things from us and we are still saying, hey, can you hold us for, uh, for us to finish winning our league and when we are done. Let's talk about that, winning the league. How do you, that's, 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 that's massive, that's big ambition, winning the league in a zone where you have Hazakas ladies and they've almost dominated that zone. Mm -hmm. How do you intend to achieve that? The last time we were at second, which placed us third in the whole league, you remember that the diff goal difference was one. The point difference was one. No, even goal difference, we are ahead of them, but it was a point difference that was one that made them win the Southern. You see, I keep telling people that, see, Hazakas live on past glory. Really? Reality. Wow. And they were in the finals of the CAF Champions League. Yes, but they were not winners of the Champions League. And it, you see, it, it, it's time we clear this facts. Hazakes played in the Champions League finals. Yeah. Good. They won the FA Cup, they won the Premier League. Good deal. Mm. There's been many, you see, I don't want us to play into the Kotokohas game, yeah. Kotokohas rivalry, but the truth is that I keep hearing this whole thing of Hazakes saying they are the champions of Africa. No. Are we going to be that low of saying that they are still champions of Africa? End of story. Mm. Now, whether you, whether you come first, you come third, you come second, as far as you are not first, it ends the story. They won the Wafu, so in the, the whole of So West maybe what West. you could say is, like, they are the Wafu champions. Mm -hmm. I would get it. Mm -hmm. And that one, a lot of other teams would do that. I, I think that the, if you check what happened last season when Wafu had, and this year, this year, teams came in more powerful, more stronger, more organized than last year. So even last year, I, 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 I watched all the matches and, and I know that Nana and Basigi and everybody watched those matches and they cannot compare last year's game with the game of this year. This year's games were tougher, they were more refined, people were ready for it and people wanted to show something to Africa. So they can't compare the two. But you see, Hazakes may be the not, I, I, I always say that I'm rather afraid of underdogs than people that make a lot of noise. Because the underdogs have a way they excite themselves. And we have many underdogs coming in this year, especially for the southern zone. We have very great teams coming up. And these great teams are rather my stopper. For Azakes, like I said, we've beaten them many times. We'll beat them again. But what we are supposed to do is to make sure that the underdogs that are coming in, who you may see as nobodies, they are younger and they are vibrant. So you have to stop them. And for us, we are going in to stop them. And that is what we are going to do. We are stopping everybody because, see, Barry, we, we've, we've done it before. People know. And this is the time to prove it again. And it, it's just like football is a game of chance. And sometimes you win some, you gain. You, yes, we are looking at a point where we are looked at as a world-class team, as a team that appreciates the Africanness in us, yet we are able to project ourselves internationally. So we don't just do the playing on the pitch, we do more off-pitching because that is what we need to do. That whether there is a Black Queens going on World Cup, whether there is a Princess going on World Cup or not, there should be a berry that is able to say that our players are getting good playing time and they are being projected internationally. So Azakas ladies, you, you, you play Azakas ladies on the, on, the first, on the 7th of October. Mm. Are you ready? Because 2-0. You're scoring a 2-0. Oh, you you see, it, 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 but it, 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 it's just two? Yeah, you could score three or four, but you chose no, two. Why, you see, why two? It's it, 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 it a payback for the misbehavior that happened when we went We're there. They're really paid by that. Yes, because it, it, it destroyed, no joke, there were people that wanted to come into the game. Because every day, sitting down as a politician and as a public person, I tried to convince more friends to want to be part of the game. I had a few friends going there, a few political people going to watch it and it, it was a deterrent for them like it's just the kind of game you guys do so for me it's, it's a payback to so, talk on and 7th october yes. against Azakas for his revenge sort of it's not just a revenge it's like i said it, it it's to clear the name of football and make football beautiful like it used to be mm -hmm. and let the world know that see it happened but we have come to clean it mm -hmm. and we are going to help Azakas to clean it themselves yeah. Interesting. That, that's interesting. And I'm sure. And I've just said it's a 2 0. It's a 2 0. 2 0.
And we'll record it. We're definitely going to record it. And then uh, after 7th of October, we'll call you and ask. To yes, it's, it's going to be a two nil. If it's three, that's fine. But then, like I said, our girls are going to give them a two straight and tell them that, see, we are your, you have been alive before us. But you see, we, we are your new seniors and you would have to treat us well anytime you meet us at home. Seniors? Yes. I'm sure Coach Basi would definitely not be happy here. Oh, but Basigi knows that, that he knows. And you see, anytime he had had any interview, he tells it that, see, if there is any team he's afraid of and he prepares well to meet. If there is any team that anybody prepares well to meet, it's Barry. Mm. You'd be amazed that a team that is even going, see, migration was going on relegation. So down. The week they were supposed to play us, if I tell you the kind of training migration had, and when they came to play they played us with their minds. All of them had to play. They had to go back to bring Adwa Bayo to play. You can imagine. <laughs> but they wouldn't let Adwa <laughs> come to play. No, Adwa won't play for against Hazakes. No, but they, they had to make sure all their old team members oh were goodness. coming on the field. They that is what they do. I don't have to play that. Wow. And, and, and it happens every time. That see, any team that may be terrible, when they meet Barry, they have a strategy. And you have to have a strategy. Maybe we should ask Azakes why they decided to withdraw from the Super Cup. Oh my yeah. God. <laughs> amazing stuff. Well, it's been fun. It's been fun having the conversation with you, uh, Ms. Gifty. Uh, we'll definitely revisit this, particularly after yes, your after first year. We want seven, to see yeah. how your 2 0 uh, prediction went. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think if it goes well, it means I'm going to be, I'm going to be the next predictor. Maybe Prophet Nigel. <laughs> Add Nigel to your name, or something. maybe, yeah, uh, maybe give to Nigel. Yeah, mm -hmm. Nigel will tell you, can come and pay something for using his name. <laughs> but I mean, wish you all the best uh, thank in the coming you. season. Thank we you. wish women's football all the best, and uh, thank we'll you. definitely be following it and see how. Yeah, you should be first. giving us more uh, time, you should be giving us more time to discuss it, and then maybe media should be doing more press briefing with us, mm -hmm. and then be interested in our game because our game is becoming of age and very soon our game, there's going to be so much money in our game that if you guys decide to be part of our game, we are going to make you richer. Yeah, maybe you should start giving us some money then. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah we will, as, far as, as far as there is money, why not? When there is yeah. money, we all share. 250,000 is a lot of money. Want yeah, but, but we have 20 clubs that are playing. So mm -hmm. if even the 250,000 is going to be divided by the 20 clubs, if it was 200, everybody was going to get how much? 20,000? Well, you can give us maybe $1,000 a week. We can work with that. Thousand dollars a week means we are going to finish all the money on media. <laughs> anyway, anyway, I mean, great, great, great. It's been fun, and uh, we will be following the women's game closely and next month. And of course, we will be we'll be there in the game involving Berry ladies and Azakas ladies. Uh, we've been speaking to Miss Kifty or our women's, uh, and um, we'll be back. We'll definitely have a part two of this conversation. I'm very curious to see how Berry ladies fare against Azakas ladies and whether they win the league and get to Africa. We are just waiting to see. But uh, we'll meet again next time. My name is Razak Musbao. Thanks so much for your time. After all the sporting action, we welcome you back as I share with you my blunt thoughts for today. And I've titled it, Losing from Both Ends, Our Natural Resources in Crisis and Our Economy in Tatters. Let me take you back in time today, far back in time to AD 536. If you're a scholar of history or science, you may have heard of the Latin term Annus Horribilis, literally meaning horrible year. From the research done by scientists, it is said that AD 536 was the coldest year in the last 2,300 years, which made the winter season a survival season for most cultures. Contemporary scholars also tell us that it is not only the fact that it was a really cold winter that made it a bad year, but also many strange events where the climate changed all of a sudden. Some scholars have noted that they saw heavy snow in China during the peak period of summer. Besides uh, the Chinese culture not being used to very cold weather, the main problem was that most crops were killed due to the harsh climate, therefore creating a famine. This did not only happen in China, but in many other parts of the world where snow never settled. Some scientists argue that this was due to the sun not offering the same level of heat during that particular year. Many periods were recorded where South America would suffer from three long months of heavy rain, followed by months of drought, 
This would once again affect the agriculture within the continent, not only killing the main source of the economy, but also creating a famine. What impacted agriculture and the well-being of humans uh, during this year was the multiple volcanic eruptions in the northern hemisphere of the globe. This led to the engulfment and darkness of half of the world due to a massive dark cloud that didn't allow the sun's heat to reach the Earth's ground, therefore lowering temperatures. This also explains why this was the coldest year. Besides not having much natural heat, Agriculture once again suffered enormously due to the lack of sunlight, which was vital to the growth of plants. Just imagine not being able to discern between night and day as it was always dark. And all this while, starving to death and freezing cold. This darkness lasted 18 months, so most of the year, AD 536, was lived in complete obscurity. Around the same time, though not in the same year, that is about 541 AD to 549 AD, the bubonic plague caused by the bacteria Yersinia pestis also broke out through transmission from rats to humans and was carried on ships to the rest of the world. In less than a year, the pandemic had spread worldwide covering most of Europe, Asia, North Africa, and the East. Scientists estimate that almost 50% of the world's population was wiped out in the nine years the pandemic took place. I could go on and on about the year 536, considering the worst year in history, but let me cap it off here. I'm sure you get my drift, right? In this fourth republic, and I'm open to contestation on this, this year, 2022, could very well be our own Annus Horribilis, a year of extremely bad events, or to be more exact, a horrible year. But just how bad is a horrible year? It depends on whom you're talking to. Queen Elizabeth II of blessed memory, for example, used this expression in a speech in 1992 to describe that year when there was a serious fire at Windsor Castle, the Princess Royale got divorced, the Duke of York separated from his wife, and the Prince of Wales had marital problems. That was a horrible year for her. For us here in Ghana, I suppose we are more concerned about the bread and butter matters that affect our daily lives, which, upon reflection, makes me believe that 2022 has in fact been a Horrible year for Ghanaians, if not the worst in our fourth Republican history. Yes, we've had to deal with the global crises of COVID-19 and the Russo-Ukrainian war. But we are not alone in this enterprise. So why do we find ourselves on the cusp of becoming, if we've not already become, that is, another Sri Lanka? When even our more, much poorer neighbors are hale, hearty, and living appreciably well, even in the eye of the storm. From the highest fuel prices I have witnessed in my life here in Ghana, to some of the worst prices I have seen for food and drink and everything in between, to the imposition of the e-levy against the popular will of the people, to the abysmal management of our economy, which is fast crumbling, this indeed has been a horrible year. I shall get down to the economic data a little later, but let me just say this. It is said that he who pays the piper calls the tune. Ghanaians, through their votes, paid the piper, this NPP administration. Yet when we called the tune, expressing our opposition to the e-levy, the piper fail, failed to play the tune. The piper wasn't playing fair, and not just that in this instance alone. So we had to show the piper where power lay, and we did considering the pathetic showing of that levy. I ask, why heap misery upon an already suffering people? Why must it come down to this? Before we get into the economy though, let's take a quick look at our agriculture and how it's been impacted by Galamsey. Our lands and natural resources minister is on record to have said that small-scale mining contributes 40% of our revenue from gold extraction. I ask, how much exactly is that? And at what cost to our environment? How come a few years ago we stayed such mining activities and still sold more ounces of gold than we had for decades? Our waters today are looking very colorful, like something out of the Milky Way galaxy in which our solar system can be found. From different shades of beige to brown, we have turned our cherished bodies, water bodies, into pools of death. Behold, Ghana, for your water bodies, at least, what has become of them? Look at them. Look at the Totoa stream, Afu Afu. Look at the Amoya. Look at the Ankobra. Look at the River Bia. Look at the Tano, the Nui, the River Ofin, the River Bonsa. Just look at them. We've been told that even if we stopped dabbling in Galamse today and brought all those activities to a grinding halt, it would take about a hundred years to restore our water bodies to anything close to what they were before. Do you see why it was highly irres irresponsible for the agri minister to talk about, quote, just 2% of our cocoa farmland that has been lost to Galamse and that 2% was nothing? That 
coupled with the chemical issues of mercury and cyanide contamination and other long-standing problems like farmers selling off cocoa land for rubber tree planting and other cash crop production for fast money means we are looking at fast dwindling levels of production. In simple terms, we could slip badly and lose not just our spot, but our reputation as producing the best quality cocoa worldwide. But do our misleaders care? Have they shown the leadership we need in this respect? Take another look at these water bodies and give me an answer. Contemplate the unprecedented damage to our landscape through illegal mining activities in which some members of the ruling administration have been found complicit. And I'm not just talking about now. I'm talking about all that was revealed through the Anas expose on the likes of Charles Bissu, then later the Ekoewusi saga, among many others. But before any proper investigations could be conducted, didn't the system rush to clear them and allow them to enjoy their booty? The Aisha Huang case itself is a critical example, especially when her disappearance or purported deportation which our president said he wasn't even certain of, was managed or stage managed in the way it was, with political elements telling us, the masses, she had stolen from, that we stood to gain nothing through her incarceration. Well, we emboldened her, and now she's back, and we're putting on a show to save face. If we had acted the first time and shown good faith, we would have no need to save face, Mr. President. Akunta Mining, owned by your party's Ashanti Regional Chairman, has been singled out for blame. But what has your administration done to punish him personally? Nothing. His outfit engaged in criminality by operating without a license in a restricted area, a forest reserve of all places. But have the long arms of the law caught up with him? No. Will they ever do so? I doubt it. But wait, lest I forget, even Sir John World part of the Achibota Forest, another forest reserve, to his family members. At Etiwa, and I can say I guess the MPP has quite an interest in the forest reserves, doesn't it? As it is, Mr. President, your administration has failed to rein in those destroying our land and water bodies in this manner, and in many other respects, which is why we are where we are today. Our cocoa and coffee risk being banned. Also considering the fact that cocoa production is based on land size, Indonesia, and I'll show you shortly, could soon overtake us on the global production log. Add that to the fact that cyanide and mercury are polluting our land and water re uh, re resources because of Galamse. And we could also lose out on producing the world's highest quality cocoa beans. And all because our leaders failed to lead, failed to act. Hold on for me. In recent times, Information Minister Kojo Ponkrumah made it clear when he put up this post on Twitter. In Europe, there is a new legislation that could soon make Ghanaian cocoa and coffee unexportable to many international markets. Earlier this week in Brussels, I chaired a two-day forum, the future of Ghanaian cocoa and coffee value chains in the face of this new EU legislation. There's more to this legislation, but of course, definitely. We want more cocoa and we are supporting Ghana and the Ivory Coast to produce cocoa and other commodities in a socially and environmentally sustainable manner. That is the EU ambassador to Ghana. That is what they are saying. Is it sustainable? Are you producing it in ways that will actually stick to international standards? And with cyanide and mercury in there, we are on a very slippery slope. But look at this. Why I feel the agri minister goofed. The Ivory Coast is here, 2.2 million tons is what they produce, according to data. Ghana is at 800,000, but look at Indonesia, 739,483. We can forget Nigeria and Ecuador. It means that if we keep slipping the way we are doing, we are soon going to lose out. Soon. Sooner rather than later. That is why when the Greek minister made the comment about only 2%, I found it egregious. And just when you thought things couldn't get any worse, Ghana for, they actually do. Let's focus on the economy now. The World Bank now says our debt to GDP is set to hit 104.6% by end of year. That puts us in very ignominious company. We're rubbing shoulders with countries like Eritrea, Sudan, Cape Verde, and Mozambique. Can you even imagine that? This Ghana for is the very first time we find ourselves in this territory where our debt to GDP is crossing 100%. It also means our economy is facing severe debt distress, as is evinced by the Fitch and Moody's downgrades we have seen recently. The World Bank blames our central bank, which we would have counted on to see the writing on the wall and act quickly to protect us, for looking on till inflation skyrocketed before tweaking our monetary policy rates. Even worse, our currency, the Ghana CD, has slumped a whopping 60% this year alone. 60%! For context, the Ghana CD had lost just about 2% of its value around this time last year. The CD Ghana 4 remains the worst performing currency in Africa, 
the second worst performing currency in the world. How do we get out of this foul rut? What do we do? Where do we turn? What should be our stance and our posturing? Definitely not one of parrying blame, but of accepting responsibility and of being practical, of being honest with the people and humbly engaging so we can avert even worse. After all, is anyone happy when things go bad? It affects us all, thick, thin, short, tall, rich, poor, journalist, the ordinary man on the street. We, all of us, need our hands to be on deck to remedy the situation, I agree. But first, our misleaders must act like leaders and show true leadership. Without that, God help us, but this could be far worse than anything we've ever known. Before I cut, a, cut off my blunt thoughts today, this is the true state of our economy. This is the debt to GDP ratio by end of year, as projected by the World Bank. Eritrea, 234.90%. Sudan, 183.80%. Cape Verde, 147.7%. Ghana, 104.6%. Mozambique, 102.6%. We have no business being here. And the economists will tell you we shouldn't even be in this range. Then, you look at the sub-Saharan African countries with projected debt to GDP above 100%. According to the World Bank, in Ghana, the central bank delayed interest rate hikes until inflation soared from 13.9% in January 2022, when we were complaining, to 19.4% in March, followed by a massive depreciation of the CD. And that's why it is laying the blame squarely at the doorstep of the central bank. And this has been made mention of. When you look at this, again, the worst performing currencies, you would see, comparatively, the CFA franc has lost 13.3%. Malawi, 25.4%. Sudan, 28.6%. South Sudan, 50.8%. Ghana, in our ignominious position, with 60%. Then you look at the CD to dollar depreciation. In 2017, 4.9%. Went up in 2018, hit 15.7%, the highest we had seen in 2019. Then 2023, 0.9%. 2021, 4%. And then, look at that. A whopping 60% in 2022. But just to wrap the conversation, unsustainable debt, what does it mean to the IMF? In cases where a country's debt is assessed as unsustainable, the IMF is precluded, forbidden, from providing financing unless the member takes steps to restore debt sustainability, including by seeking a debt restructuring from its creditors. This is where we are. Because we are right on the cusp, the precipice, the verge of debt and sustainability. This is where we are. But most of all, as I end, voices of conscience must speak up about these matters, loud and clear, so our leaders too will wake up from their slumber, just as some of us have, lest disaster overtake us. Like Osajifu Dr. Kwame Nkrumah said in his speech on Independence Day, we have awakened. We will not sleep anymore. Today, from now on, there is a new African in the world. Today, from now on, let there be a new Ghanaian mindset, a new kind of leadership mentality, a new kind of patriotism, that love for God and country to propel our motherland to the heights she deserves to be at. Ghana deserves much better. My name is Benjamin Akaku. These are my blunt thoughts served to you, raw, unedited, and diluted. God richly bless Ghana and make her great and strong. Thank you for staying with us on the AM show. Time now for us to get into the nitty gritty when it comes to our economy, uh, the downgrades we've, we've got from Fitch and Moody's and where we find ourselves as far as what the World Bank is telling us. Well, joining us for uh, those conversations, we have Professor Lord Mensah, uh, who is with the University of Ghana Business School. We also have uh, Professor John Gachi, who is with the UCC School of Business. 
Professor Lord Mensah, a very good morning to you. Thank you for uh, joining the conversation. Yeah, good morning and good morning to our viewers. What would be your basic appreciation of what the World Bank uh, has been telling us from the fact that the central bank was uh, lethargic in its approach? It should have started hiking the monetary policy rate maybe from January by the latest, uh, and, and it failed to do that. And then the compound of matters we're having to grapple with that, look, we could be seeing inflation of around 104.6% by the end of year, which will uh, just might ease up next year, but get even worse in our electoral year. Let's start from the generality of what the World Bank has been telling us. What do you make of it? Yeah, I mean, it's the assessment of the economy. And uh, being an external you know, stakeholder of this economy, it is anticipated that once in a while they will come and give us, I mean, their perspective of the Ghanaian economy. And truly, um, what they said is a reflection of what is happening on the ground. Um, well, looking at our debt, I think we've been calculating our debt without the contingent liabilities over the years. And if I say contingent, contingent liabilities, what I mean is the um, liabilities that have some inflows tied to them. So we think it's not debt. And we should remember that all those you know, inflows that are tied to this debt operate in a, under a certain umbrella, which is the economy. So if the economy is not doing well, obviously those inflows will also be impaired and it can affect your debt payment. So they added all this together, uh, taking into consideration the ESLA loans, the um, high, Sino Hydro loans. Sino Hydro, we think right. of those. Yes, we think we've tied it to a certain raw materials and all those, and as a result of that, sorry, a certain resource, and as a result of that, the likelihood of default is, is, is very, very less. But, you know, debt is a debt. Once the country is carrying a liability, you cannot separate them. Uh, you can only separate It appears the connection to uh, Professor Mensah uh, has a bit of a, a bug, a bit of a problem. We'll try to rectify that and uh, get him back on uh, the line. Of course, he was sharing his thoughts on what the World Bank has been telling us recently. And it was uh, also, you know, broadening the conversation that we, we shouldn't just look at the debt. We should look at the other liabilities we have and how they feed into it. Of course, there's been talk about the Sino-Hydro deal and how um, supposedly... When, um, you Right. Uh, Prof, so we lost you at a point. I, I, I would want you to go back by about some 30, 40 seconds and start again with the thoughts you were sharing with us. Can you hello, hear me, Prof? Can you hear me, please? Yes, hello. Okay, so Prof, if you can hear me, we lost you briefly. Uh, we lost yes. about 30 seconds or 40 seconds of what you were saying. So just recap that, that particular point you were making and about yeah, our liabilities. So what, I, what I was saying is that, um, yeah, the World Bank's uh, perspective of our debt, um, they have added, you know, the contingent liabilities and then the likely financing of our budget deficit, I mean, for this particular year. And um, when you put all together, you, you, you have that 104% of our GDP as our potential debt. So effectively, um, it's a signal that is on the ground. Of course, government must finance its budget deficit, the huge deficit that was created. And as a result of that, we can see the debt reaching the 100% and above. Debt to GDP. So in other words, that is no surprise uh, to you. But is that the reality that should have been painted to the ordinary Ghanaian? Because some people have said that all of these constitute debt, open debt, that we should have uh, been adding to our books, but we found um, smart ways of setting them aside. Is, is, that, is that correct? Uh, yes, yes, yes. And you, you, see, um, well, you see, when you read our budget, we normally read it um, as oil and without oil. So the same way we should have expected, you know, our debt to be read as, you know, debt with contingent liability and debt without contingent liability. And then the likely or the potential financing of the budget deficit put all together. And that would have given us, you know, a good picture of the happenings um, on our, you know, public, in our, in our public, you know, on our public balance sheet. They effectively, um, 
Yes, for political reasons, let me put it that way. Because if you report a huge debt, I mean, the politician or the policymaker knows the, I mean, the, the response that will come from the public. And I believe that is why probably uh, we were not reporting the debt with the contingent liabilities. But from the World Bank's perspective, I mean, once a country is carrying a debt, it is a debt. And it's, it, it, there's nothing like, you know, um, um, contingent liability debt and non-contingent liability debt. And as this reflects uh, the true picture, that is the 104.6% that we're looking forward to, what exactly does that mean for our economy? Right now, we are hovering at over 80%, as, uh, as we've been told. What would being in that, that category, that bracket, 104.6%, and, and that puts us in very uncomfortable territory. You are looking at Sudan, South Sudan, uh, Mozambique, uh, uh, Cape Verde, Eritrea, among other countries. What does that mean for Ghana's economy? Well, uh, what it means is that when you take your total economic output at the end of the year, it will not be even uh, it will not be able to match up your debt. That is what it means in general. But I, what uh, what I can say is that you know having a debt of one hundred and four percent under normal circumstance, if you have a very good asset or you have very good a, economic infrastructure base that can generate enough cash to pay for this debt, it shouldn't have been a problem. Because we've seen countries that, you know, can boast of debt to GDP ratio of about 100% and above, some to the extent of 200%. When you talk about Japan and all those, some are even 120% and above. But these countries can boast of national assets that can easily raise money to pay. So when you relate their debt to revenue, I mean, generation, you realize that they are way, 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 way huge to the extent that um, it should be able to, payment of this debt is not a problem. But what makes the Ghana one or other African countries, you know, that are recording debt of above 100%, 200%. Two hundred percent and above is right. that the asset quality, the infrastructure quality that the economy has to rely on it to pay for this debt will be a problem. Okay, so that is why when our debt exceeds, you know, um, seventy percent and above, it becomes a threshold categorized for um, country. You know, raising money to pay your debt. I mean, will be a quite will be quite problem a problematic. So if, um, I, I think um, what we need to do as a country uh, is that we may have to tone down on some of our expenditure lines, and then get to know that um, the situation we find ourselves in is not you know a situation that we have to be aggressive. And if you take it and bring it to the downstream, I mean how it is building up into our economy. I mean, it's a reflection of everything. All the economic indicators and all those are giving you the signal that, yes, indeed, your debt is growing. And as a result of that, you, may, you are not able to, you know, raise money externally to even show up your balance of payment, you know, to even, you know, um, supply your um, foreign exchange needs to the extent of, you know, building up into the um, exchange rates, you know, increase and all those. So effectively, it is something that I think uh, we may have to set up as a country and come to the reality. The World Bank has classified Ghana as being at risk of high debt distress. You've seen the Bloomberg lists in the past, which have placed us right a notch uh, beneath El Salvador in terms of the countries most likely to default on their uh, debts as far as risk uh, is, is concerned. When you consider that and, and what is happening now, is it a fair reflection of where we've been heading now that the World Bank finally confirms this? And what does it mean in, in real terms, in terms of our capacity to repay our debts? Yeah, you know, when you look at, you know, our debt, I think that I, the World Bank and those Bretton Woods institutions 
are not doing us a favor. They know very well that um, they are serving as more or less uh, insurance in, in a form. Let me put it that way, national insurance. Because whatever the case may be, we normally fall on IMF for a rescue. So IMF is more or less uh, an insurance at that you know, national level. And for every insurance that you take, the insurer sometimes you know, gives you the signal that put this in place, put that in place. They don't wait for you to be in trouble before they come in or before they start announcing your debt levels to, to signal that you are not doing well you, or you're doing well. I believe that this country, sorry, these institutions have not been, you know, helpful because, in a, you know, they wait for you to be in trouble before they start coming with the numbers. They should have come up with these numbers. I remember I was reading an article last year, which uh, was somewhere July 2021. 20, uh, Our debt was in distress at the time. They never made it public. It you you, you mean, you mean as far as you are concerned, or per this article, as as early as July 2021, we were in debt distress. Oh, yes. They categorized our debt, both the overall debt. They didn't work on the, uh, the domestic debt. They looked at the um, overall debt and they looked at the standard debt. And they categorized both as a distress in your um, debt. And so I don't know why they are now coming up. All these things have been happening all this while. And I think if they were to, you know, hit that our debt is in distress. Government wouldn't have, you know, read a budget and then indicate that huge, you know, budget deficit, which will also require extra financing to build up the debt again. So effectively, um, I can say that they're not helping us in a sense that they, they, they wait and we put ourselves in a situation where it becomes, you know, um, difficult before they start coming in with you know, um, I mean, those numbers. But clearly, the build-up from 2019 all the way coming, after we exited the IMF, the trajectory that it's expenditure lines, and then in terms of, you know, the revenue generation, they should have gotten a clue on, you know, a country that is heading towards, you know, trouble. But they never, you know, gave us that signal until we found, we found ourselves in trouble before they came in. So tell me, what then can be the solution? You say that maybe these Bretton Woods institutions should be proactive. My, my curiosity is that even in this instance, uh, there seems to be a divergence, not a convergence of thought. You remember I had that conversation with the IMF boss, uh, Kristalina uh, Georgieva, and she said that, look, what we were facing was by and large on the back of the exogenous shocks, as she put them, COVID-19 and the Russo-Ukrainian war. The World Bank now is telling us, no, it's more of internally what is going on in your country. And it even goes as far as citing the central bank and its failure to deal with the monetary policy rate from as early as June, uh, January, I beg your pardon, uh, this year. Is that part of the problem, this divergent opinion from the Bretton Woods institutions? I think um, these institutions may have a uh, capacity issue uh, in a sense that... Um, they have a lot of information um, when it comes to the dynamics of this country. Now, the divergent views may come from the interest that these um, um, different um, institutions are looking at the economy. Uh, when you take the um, IMF, they are typically diplomatic in a sense that they look at you know, the, the economy in general and then look at the uh, general external shocks that are likely to have impact on the, um, on the economy. They look at the economy in aggregation. But the World Bank has positioned itself in such a way that sometimes they grow down within the economy and then get to know the developmental issues and all those. And for sure, um, they will come with their perspective to indicate that, yes, of course, what we, the problem we are facing um, has to do with internal. So it has to do with perspective and the purpose that the institution stands for. IMF lends to Ghana. IMF deals with Ghana. But the World Bank deals with Ghana and its developmental dimensions. And as a result of that, they will be able to come up with, you know, um, the details. And I can tell you that the perspective will always look, look different because of the purposes and then the objectives. I mean, uh, the way and manner they deal with the various countries.
expenditure lines. You made that comment a short while ago. Have we done enough in that respect? If not, what more should we be doing? Uh, even as we, we have unsustainable debt, and now you say we should tone down on expenditure as well. What, what would you want to see in that respect? Yes, there's more to it. Um, if you take uh, the, for instance, the 22 billion financing that came from um, um, Bank of Ghana to the, uh, the government, I was expecting that having a problem at hand, having a situation where our debt is growing, a situation where our inflation is growing to a point where, you know, our food inflation is leading, I mean, the inflation disaggregation, um, I was expecting the Bank of Ghana, in as much as they are providing the 22 billion, to direct, you know, the government as to where to spend the money, but not to give the money in an open form for which the government, at its own discretion, would direct, you know, how to use the money. Our Bank of Ghana stands for control of prices and all those um, inflation measures that we need. So when you are providing funds to the uh, to the government. It is, I was expecting that, okay, fine. We're struggling to bring, you know, food from the hinterlands to the, to, the, to the market in Accra or somewhere in Kumasi. Government taking this money, are they going to invest in that direction to ensure that food comes to the market so that food inflation probably may reduce in, the, in that direction? No, we didn't see that. We knew government has taken money from the Bank of Ghana, but as to what the money is supposed to go into, we don't know, you know, that, 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 that we don't know in that regard. So um, it tells you that in as much as, you know, we are looking at expenditure, we should look at the critical areas that we can spend to make sure that some of these indicators that we need to control to help the ordinary Ghanaian live and live comfortably, we target and spend in that line to ensure that at least I mean, we, we hit the nerve of the economy. But that is not the case. We open up our expenditure. For instance, you, we go for loans from the, from the euro bond market. And because these loans are not earmarked, um, it turns out to be that um, government is comfortable going for that loan. And come to, uh, they come in and then spend it, you know, anyway, anyhow. So as a result of that, um, I'm expecting that we need to grow down and then get to know you know, our expenditure lines, at least anywhere we are putting money, ensure that our revenue will be generated from, you know, this area. So we should match up our expenditure to our, our revenue generation, and that should be, uh, that should go a long way to help us. Matching revenue with expenditure. Uh, will our hands be forced if we get an IMF deal? Maybe even before we get into that. Uh, so looking at what we are seeing now in terms of our debt and sustainability. It is clear with the IMF that we are precluded or they are precluded from giving us a deal if we do not meet sustainability levels. Looking at our, our, our situation currently, um, what would you say? You remember that the, the Minister of Finance told us that on November 15, he gave us a hard date, concrete, that would have our next budget statement and hopefully by then, we would have, you know, an IMF program around which we can work. October uh, think, uh, is, is, is already that, here. That, you, you see, you know the problem we are facing? Um, the government wants to hide behind, you know, the IMF to call in for, you know, debt restructuring. But I can tell you that we need a debt restructuring before the IMF program. The only problem is that government is not bold enough to tell Ghanaians that we need a debt restructuring. They want to go behind the IMF to call for the debt restructuring. But the IMF may want you to position yourself for the program. Positioning yourself for the program means that if your debt has gotten to a point where you are not likely to pay, renegotiate with your creditors. And that is what the government should be bold enough to come out with. Before, so that IMF will get to know that, okay, fine, indeed, You've renegotiated on your debt, and as a result of that, if we are to give you three billion, you should be able to, you know, work with it. Because IMF will never give you money when you are in debt distress, when they know very well that the money that they are giving you will not make any impact. So uh, the government should come out boldly and tell Ghanaians that, hey, this is the situation. Our debt has took us 
we've got you to a level where wherever, whatever investment you did, probably you may have to take a discount. And as a result of that, we should be able to, you know, um, 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 have an IMF program. So I don't think waiting for the IMF program before we do the debt restructuring is something that will work. We have to look at debt restructuring first before we, you know, we, we, we go in for the IMF program. We shouldn't hide behind IMF and say that it's the IMF that is giving us instruction. Uh, that, that, that is a very interesting point you make. Uh, and, and, and let me just say a very good morning to They will never finance a mm. country that is in this place. Right. Uh, hold for me, uh, Professor Mensa. Th there's something I want to engage you on further. But let me just say a very good morning to Professor uh, John Gachi of the University of Ghana. In fact, of the University of Cape Coast School of Business. Uh, Professor Gachi, a very good morning to you. Good morning. It's a pleasure having you. I hope you're well, sir. By the grace of God. Great. Uh, let, let me just get this quick take from Professor Mensa, and I'll come to you, Professor Gachi. So, uh, does that mean you are in agreement, Professor Lord Mensa, with Martin Amidu, who has also waded into the conversation, and he is basically saying that government is using the IMF as a smokescreen to force an austerity budget on the people. Is your thinking in alignment with Martin Amidu's thinking? Oh, yes, because some of the things we may have to reposition ourselves very well. In fact, the next budget, government should give the signal that we are prepared to cut down our expenditure. The next budget, government should give us the Oh, uh, what the line is doing to us, the connection this morning. But at least I got that point I wanted uh, at least clarity on. Uh, he says he is in agreement with Martin Amidu's take. Let me bring in Professor uh, John Gachi. So what would be your, your overall assessment of the latest that we have? Of course, in recent times, we've had another downgrade. Uh, there's been Fitch, and now there's been Moody's as well, downgrading our economy, our uh, risk of debt distress, our ability to make, uh, meet our international payments. And now, uh, Professor Mensa, just hold for me. Uh, let, let, let me put this question to uh, Professor Gachi. And now... The World Bank is telling us we fail okay. internally to deal with our situation. Uh, Professor Gachi, what, what is your overarching you know, understanding of the latest information we have to deal with? Professor Gachi, are you there? Hello, Professor Gachi. All right, uh, Professor Mensah, if you can hear me. Yes, I can hear you. Loud All right. And clear. So your, your connection went off again. We jo lost just a little bit. You told me you were in agreement with Martin Amidu. Why exactly? I do. I do because, you know, um, the budget that we're going into um, for next year, uh, the government should give a signal of um, being concerned when it comes to expenditure and then show some aggression in revenue generation. So effectively... It will be required by the country, i.e. the government, to position itself in such a way that they can have a very good IMF program. And like I told you earlier, IMF will not finance a country and knowing very well that whatever money or whatever support they are providing to the country will not have any impact. Because if you are in distress and you are giving, you know, um, um, $3 billion, what will you use the money for? You have, you have no choice than to use it to settle your debt. But then before they give you a facility, you may have to negotiate with your creditors. You may have to position the country that, to, to the extent that you are not prepared to you know, spend in a manner that you used to be, and that you are going to be financially disciplined. Then they will come in. So uh, those are the austere measures, because... What is an austere measure? You were hiding the country or running the country, giving freebies here and there. Look at what happened during the uh, electricity. You can name them. 
you know, to the extent of so put all this together. It's like having a baby that you know you are you are providing milk for the baby. When you change to cocoa, the baby will start complaining. So um those are the austere measures Ghanaians may have to bear with. At the end of the day, we've enjoyed ourselves by right, from the government for providing certain freebies and all those products. But going into an, an IMF program, you may have to position yourself that you cannot provide the milk that you used to provide for your, I mean, your citizens again. And as a result of that, you are ready to cut down some of these provisions. And, you know, uh, you have a program with the IMF. So uh, those are the things that we should expect. Uh, Professor Gachi, can you hear me now? All right, we've lost Professor Gachi. Let's continue on that tangent, uh, Professor Mentor. So... Uh, you, you made mention of the fact that even before getting an IMF program, you have to position yourself uh, for the program. Does that mean that we are not uh, putting ourselves in that frame of mind, economically speaking? We are not positioning ourselves from where you sit for the, the IMF program? Yeah, we're not. If we are, we would have started, you know, conscientizing Ghanaians of possibly renegotiation on our debt. Because that is the main, you know, um, 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 food on the table when it comes to the negotiations with the IMF, is our debt that is choking us. And that is what is building up into all the economic difficulties, inflation, exchange rate. Because of our debt, we couldn't assess the international market. Because of our debt, you know, there are so many things we cannot do as a country. And so that is what is going to be, you know, uh, so what is on the table for discussion. And so uh, if we are ready for an IMF program, would have started conscientizing Ghanaian somewhere in uh, um, somewhere in our last budget, for which you know. But then, what happened in our last budget? Government gave the signal that he's prepared to borrow more by declaring a huge budget deficit, which needs financing, and financing which is tilted towards the domestic market. And as a result of that, interest rate has started going up, treasury rate has started going up. Losing, you know, um, the possibility of, you know, investing money in other things rather than to put it in government bills. So what is happening on our markets is that people are more comfortable, you know, instead of doing business on their own to invest their money in government, you know, treasury bills and notes, which is, you know, um, yielding around 30 percent and apart. Sometimes uh, the short term being around 29.7 percent. So effectively, it tells you that. Yes, indeed. We are not prepared. The preparation towards IMF, should, we should have given the signal from our last budget, when the government in his own wisdom or the policymaker in his own wisdom saw that the international market would have been a problem at the time. So they started tilting our financing to our local market, knowing very well that the local market, if government increases its appetite for borrowing in the local market, it's going to stifle other businesses. Because, you know, um, businesses will not be comfortable, you know, lend, uh, sorry, banks will not be comfortable lending to, you know, businesses, but they will, they will prefer lending to uh, the government, and which, in the end, credit to the private sector will start reducing. And so, effectively, it tells you that uh, government wasn't prepared all this year round. We are now getting, you know, into the groove that, we yes, indeed, we need an IMF program. And the government, for, for the government to be bold, to come to Ghanaians that, yes, for the IMF program, we may have to, I mean, position ourselves by renegotiating our debt. And as a result of that, we are going to cut down some of the interest payments that we promised you. And some of uh, you are having a long-term investment. You are likely to get a haircut on your principals and all those. I mean, we, we, we're not getting that. So I think we are now building up. But then the situation is, as I indicated earlier, Government is trying to hide behind, you know, IMF to call in for the renegotiation. But rather, the renegotiation should have started before, you know, the IMF program. So tell me, does that by extension mean that we run the risk of not getting a program, not just because of our levels of unsustainable debt, but also because we are not positioning ourselves in a manner that will make it possible that will not preclude the IMF from giving us a deal. Are we at that risk? Oh, yes, we are. But then, uh, not to say we will not get the program, but then we can get the program, but then it's going to take a longer time. Probably not last year, looking at maybe the first 
you know, to within the first two quarters of next year. Because the signals that is supposed to we're supposed to present to IM to indicate that we will be ready for the program. It's more or less going to be an austere budget. A budget that government is drastically going to cut down expenditure, ensure that put up some, you know, revenue enhanced, you know, um, um, mechanisms like, I mean, introducing, you know, some taxes or possibly I mean, restructuring of existing taxes here and there. And for that matter, we'll position that. So uh, IMF will start getting the signals when we go into the next year, the following year, when government starts, you know, putting the realities of the budget, the November budget on the ground. Let's continue the discussion when it comes to what has happened so far as far as our economic um, exploits are concerned or lack of exploits are concerned. When you look at what the World Bank says, it also points to the central bank and its failure to have dealt with the monetary uh, policy rate. Are you in agreement with the World Bank? And like you've mentioned, maybe from data you've read, from as early as June, July last year, we should have done that. But with the latest uh, monetary policy hikes and all of that. W why are they not working? That's the question people are answering, uh, asking. Yeah, I think they're, um, they're not working because the central bank sees itself to be uh, completely in a silo, completely, you know, um, dissociated from the economy. So central bank looks at, okay, fine, I'm, I'm, I'm in control of uh, the prices to ensure that I use the monetary policy, you know, mechanism to control prices here and there, and it ends there. That is not supposed to be the case. You can use interest rate increase, interest rate, you know, or policy rate increase, policy rate reduction to control for prices. But if the fiscal policies are not matching up with this, your policy rate, there's no way you can achieve, you know, that purpose. That is the problem we are having in this country. How the fiscal aspect of our economic management will be integrated with the policy, the monetary policy aspect, is what is killing this country. So the central bank looks at it this way. I have increased monetary policy, and as a result of that, I'm expecting inflation to reduce. My job ends there. The same central bank turns around to finance the budget deficit of a bank, of, of, the, of the government, without indicating where the government is supposed to spend this money. Because if you are lending to, I mean, a borrower of higher risk, what do you do? You direct where the money is supposed to be used. So if, you know, the country, mm -hmm. let's say Ghana, which yeah, we should, uh, you know, um, um, classify Ghana as a person, and Ghana is borrowing from the central bank, I was expecting the central bank to detect which areas the government is supposed to be spending this money to the extent that it will have impact. At the time that the central bank was providing the financing to the government, the inflation, food inflation was very high. And we got to know that food is stuck somewhere, you know, in the, in the, at, the, at the farm gate without getting to the market as a result of what? Transportation costs as a result of good roads and all those. Did we make provision for that to get the food to the cities? So effectively, um, I can tell you that until we match up, you know, our monetary policy and then the fiscal policy, we the monetary policy poli policies that we roll out will never have impact. Now, let me give you a typical, you know, um, example. We talked about planting for food and jobs, right? Planting for food and jobs. I mean, at this time, we're supposed to have certain staples on the market, which will control for the food inflation, if, even if you are taking the weighted average. If you talk about, you know, um, transportation cost, which is also part of the inflation disaggregations that we, 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 we looked at as on the higher side. Now, you can see clearly that you go to the a typical driver, private driver, you ask him what is causing you to increase your prices. They're going to tell you that I think we're experiencing some challenges once more with uh, Hello, Professor okay. Mensah's connection. Hello. I can hear Hello, you. Go you ahead. Me, Go ahead. I can hear you. Yes. So uh, what is going to happen is that the driver will tell you that, look, we are buying spare parts and then we are, you know, um, 
um, um, well, the four prize. Four prize we may not have control over. Four prize, of course, is detected by you know global market, which is seasonal. So winter time sometimes because of increase in energy usage across the globe, you know, four prices, you know, goes up during the winter times and then sometimes comes down, you know, during the summer times. Also, these are things that we can use to hedge against the price dynamics. But then the main thing we can control is, you know, the spare pass, which if we are able to manage it very well, it should go a long way to, you know, uh, build up into the control of our foreign exchange because there's no single part of a car that we manufacture in this country. At the end of the day, if you do a good road, a road that is supposed to last for um, five years, and indeed you spend money to make sure that you do a road that will last for the five years, not to do a road that contract has been subletted you know, across different chains to the extent that the actual money that is supposed to go into the road will end up being reduced and a road provision of a road that is supposed to last for five years will end up going for two years. You realize that if we do a good road, spare parts, you know, purchases will go down. Because if you talk about shocks of a car, both and not and all those, we don't manufacture them yet. They are all important. And as a result of that, if we do a good road, at least the, the, the drivers of transportation cost, the part of it which is coming as a result of spare parts, we will control that. And in a way, we we'll build up, you know, um, into, you know, our inflation control. That is why I'm saying that until the fiscal side of the economy is meet up or match up with the monetary policy, you know, part, there's no way we can achieve a, 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 a single digit inflation and sustain it. Tell me then, so when you look at exactly what we're talking about, the central bank and how it has failed to act, now at least it is acting. But we look at the latest hike in the uh, policy rate, and we're talking about 250 basis points that has hiked the level from uh, some 22% to about 24.5%. The dangers in there, as some have put forward, is that this also makes it more expensive uh, to take loans. Already, people are reeling, people on facilities. Some of them are complaining that the different banks have hiked the interest rates that they have to pay. This only means a further burden on the ordinary businessman or woman or the ordinary Ghanaian. Now, how do we stand to benefit and how do we look at the, the, the quid pro quo, the, 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 the cost-benefit analysis? You see, what is happening in this country is that as we speak now, right, Inflation is about 33.6%. You know, You're looking at policy rates, which goes up into the interest rate structures around 24.5, uh, right? Sorry. Yeah, you, you're looking at policy rate around 25, 24.5. If interest rates, you know, you're talking about treasury bills and all those that are around, you know, 29, 30% and all those. Every investor knows that when I invest, right, in the financial market, <coughs> the real returns of my investor is, is negative. My investment is negative. However, for my money to lie down, not to yield anything in my house, I'm better off putting it in the, I mean, in the, in the financial instrument. And that is why we still have investment in the financial instrument. Other than that, people would have taken their money and then go and sleep on it. Now, looking at how increase in the po policy rate will, you know, shrink or will shrink the private sector, you know, in terms of accessibility of loans, I can tell you that the private sector has never been comfortable assessing loans when the government is, you know, keenly or the government is scrambling for funds on the market with them. This be government be because, since because there's a competition, right? Come again. Because then the central bank, or in fact, government, will be competing with them, right? They will compete with them, and the investor will be comfortable giving the money to the government because of assurance, okay? Or because, you know, they know that government have that kind of sovereign guarantee to pay back their investment. And so when the private man is looking for money, and then the government is also looking for money, 
depending on the interest rate differential, the private man, sorry, the investor is even prepared to sacrifice maybe 3% or 4% and lend to the government, you know, relative to providing it to the, uh, the private man. So the central bank, sorry, the various banks across this country are investing in government bills because it is easier to make money, you know, from investing in what? Government instrument than to lend to the individuals, which you have to struggle to even identify them where they live and then where the credit exposure is very high. So they prefer, you know, gathering all the deposits and then investing in the government bills, which I call it the lazy man's, you know, banking. Because that type of banking, you can do it on a single desktop in your house where you gather funds and then put the money in the government folds and then wait for the yield. And every time they're quitting your bank as if you are, you are retailing. I call it lazy man's banking. Now, but the environment has provided itself in that manner. So if you look at any time government is reading the budget, the banks will be marking time, looking at the possible budget deficit that the government will declare. Okay? If the deficit goes up so huge, and the, in, the, in the financing of the deficit, the government indicate that they're going to finance more on the local market is a field day for the banks they need to go up because government has given the signal that they are there in need of money and as a result of that they will borrow from the local market but the banks will not be prepared to lend to the private man private man that your business gives them more exposure private man that you know your business you know will struggle at the end of the day because government is also borrowing from the the banks they are not prepared to look out for the policies that is supposed to um, help the private man grow its business. So effectively, um, it's an environment that has provided itself it, until the government, you know, stop or the government reduce its appetite for borrowing from the local market. Uh, there's no way, you know, uh, the, the private sector who have access to loan easily or at a cheaper cost. Mm. So crowding out the private sector. As, as we wrap the conversation, just a few questions for you, Doc, about two of them. So now we, we see that since March, for example, the policy rate has been hiked by 9.5%, <coughs> and it's the highest we've seen since 2017. What does this mean for T-bills and other investments uh, that ordinary people usually go for? Are, are they likely to get any windfall, or will things uh, still be what they are? Uh, T-bills are also going up. As the policy rates are going up, T-bills are gradually building up in that manner. And uh, that is how the interest rate structures uh, are supposed to be in every economy. So, so for that, it will not be affected? Well, the team bills, what will not be effective? Can you take... What uh, will, it will not be affected. I mean, the team bills and investments, they will not be affected. No, they will. I mean, unless your investment is locked. Once the policy rate has gone up, there's a likelihood that team bills will go up. So those investors who are going on the market from now to, you know, maybe end of year, We'll start enjoying the new the impact of the new policy but the old ones that have been locked you will not get that you know um effect finally uh to you prof so we're looking at 104.6 percent debt to gdp at the end of this year next year we're looking at something around 99.7 percent and then in 2024 an election year uh, it will hike again to about 101.8 what will all of this mean is it possible to hit below uh, these figures, and what will we have to do to get there? Yeah, I see that we may come below these figures because, uh, yes, when we understand that there are electionary year expenditure excesses that we anticipate, and that is why the World Bank is projecting that um, there's a likelihood that will come back above the hundred percent in the in the election years. But then remember, if we should get an IMF program, which the program extends into the election year, there will be control on expenditure. And those control of expenditure is likely to push some government out of space. 
And so effectively, and it has happened before. I mean, I can tell you that our program with IMF caused some, you know, other different parties' elections and they had to lose here and there. So government will not be getting the opportunity to, you know, um, spend the way and manner they want during the elections. And so there's a likelihood that their projections might not be, you know, um, 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 realized as, you know, expected. So it depends on the programs that we'll have with IMF and then how it's the, the extension or how long it will go. Professor Mensah, we're grateful that you engaged us uh, this morning. Always insightful. We're grateful for your time, sir. Have a good day. You're welcome, sir. All right. That is Professor Lord Mensah, lecturer at the University of Ghana Business School, telling us, uh, you know, everything about what all of this could mean for our economy moving forward. We're going to uh, take a bit of a break, and when we return, there's more right here on the AM uh, show. Do stay. Thank you very much for staying with us on the AM show. Let's talk now about Impact Week. What's that? Well, Ghana is saddled with a lot of socioeconomic problems that have proven very difficult to deal with. Youth unemployment, sanitation, the effects of climate change as seen in irregular rainfall patterns, perennial flooding, difficulties in agriculture, among other things. The question is, how do we equip the next generation for employment to become inspiring leaders, successful entrepreneurs, and game changers? Well, Impact Week is a global sustainable solution program to deal with problems using design thinking. And this year, Impact Week, supported by the Lufthansa Group, will be hosted in Ghana at the Heritage Christian College, a university in Amasaman, Accra. Well, we have our guests from the university to throw some light on this program. We're joined by Dr. Samuel Chumesi, Ankara President, Heritage Christian College, Amasaman. We also have Conrad Kakraba, Conrad is chairman of the local planning committee, Impact Week Ghana 2022 uh, of the Heritage Christian College. Okay, Doc, Conrad, a very good morning to you. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for hosting us. And thank you so much for uh, joining the conversation. But, but tell me, this entire plot, this entire idea supported by Lufthansa and the Christian College yeah. in Amasaman, how did it come about? What is it all about? Uh, I think President. Okay, so I'll, I'll let our doctor uh, go for that. Our core values include global exposure and competence okay. and entrepreneurship, among others. Mm. And so, as uh, people responsible for the management of the school, we are always looking for opportunities to uh, give our students not only head knowledge, but um, global competencies that would help them uh, solve problems. Okay. And so, as a result of that, uh, through our networks, we were able to hook up with uh, the sponsors of Impact Week. Mm. Because I was about to ask, I mean, of all the university colleges, of all the other groupings, mm. how come your institution was selected? So you actually put yourself forward? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Through our networks and those who are behind the uh, running of Heritage Christian University College. Yeah. Mm. Now, you are chairman yeah. of this group. Uh, what has it been like? What does it mean, basically, to be a part of this program? It means a lot uh, for us. This is the third time it's been held in Ghana. Okay. The first two times it was held at the University of Ghana. And this is the third time. And it's a private university that is hosting it. And we are so, so privileged to have that opportunity. First of all, because entrepreneurship is one of our core values, as the president mentioned. Okay. We want to see how our young students and graduates actually embrace the opportunities that are available through entrepreneurship. How do they identify s solutions to problems? Mm -hmm. And that's what design thinking really wants to um, be used to appropriate some of the uh, solutions that we can have to different aspects of our economy. Uh, we are talking about agriculture, 
We're talking okay. about uh, sustainability in terms of uh, climate change and how do we use renewable energy sources and all of that. We are talking about youth unemployment, which is a huge problem mm. in the country. We are talking about... Major problem. In exactly. IT and technology and security and all of those. And so we position ourselves as a university that is going to train our students to solve the problems. And they also saw the prospects in that uh, offer and they, they reached out to us as well. So are these the specific areas that the program is going to focus on? Exactly. Unemployment, um, innovation, uh, entrepreneurship, are those agriculture. The uh, exactly. areas is going to focus Exactly. So they're going to, in a period of, um, so they are currently doing what we call the train the trainer session. Okay. Uh, so they've done that for three days, this is the last day. And then next week, 110 students will be taken through these various tracts of training uh, using design thinking. And there are 29 mm. of international coaches that have come down to Ghana across the world from about seven different countries to come and then uh, support this particular process. Uh, Doc, do tell me, so obviously there's an end game. This should have a sort of impact on yes. the students who are going to participate. Yes. How will this be a game changer for these students? Uh, in a number of ways. One. Um, we are, through this program, hoping that uh, each group of students that will go through the training will come up with a, a business plan uh, to s address a problem. And the school, Okay, so it's, it's going to adopt a very practical approach. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Right. So it's not just one of those things. <laughs> so all the teams, I don't know how many teams you, you have formed, but all the various 18, groups, 18, 18 teams, exactly. teams yeah. of students. 18 of them. Yeah. yeah. Why? Um, after they've gone through the training, yeah. our goal is that each of them will come up with a business plan mm -hmm. that addresses particular socio-economic problems. Yeah. And our Center for Entrepreneurship, Philanthropy and Ethics, CEP, at Heritage Christian College, mm -hmm. is ready to support them in whatever mm -hmm. way, mm -hmm. whether with uh, working capital mm -hmm. or technical know-how, for them to implement yeah. uh, the, the, the plans. And this particular one, uh, Benjamin, is, you see, the university has really been doing this uh, yeah. in terms of uh, supporting students to right. look for solutions to problems and then develop business out of them. And we've given over 300,000 cities to our students to start their own businesses. Because for Since, us... Uh, 20 uh, 17. For us, that should for be... For your the, own students. Exactly. Yeah, our own students. That wow. should be... 300,000 CDs. Yeah. Exactly. That should be the game changer because if we just equip students with head knowledge, but they come out and then right. they're not able to get employment or they don't have skills to be able to solve any problems, then why did they even go to the university? And that is one of the things that we are focusing on as a university. Mm. Uh, if, to both of you, I was just about to ask, yeah. talk about funding, and you brought this in. So... <laughs> These, this cluster of what, 18 teams, yeah. mm -hmm. how are they going to get the funding? Is that where Lufthansa comes in? No. So Heritage Christian College, mm. from the onset, uh, made a policy where we set up what we call a Center for Entrepreneurship, Philanthropy, and Ethics. Okay. So the center um, has a foundation okay. that supports students, entrepreneurship, and startups. Mm. Yeah. So, so after this training program, those whose business plans are feasible are definitely going to be supported yeah. based upon okay. the, the kind of logistics. Of course, so the viability of, yeah, exactly. of, of the it. program yeah. must first be screened. Yeah. Yeah. And if it's deemed viable, yeah. then you and then they'll be supported. Them. And as we speak, uh, we have uh, 20, I think 25 student-led startups, yes. even before this week, before Impact Week, yeah. that the Center for Entrepreneurship are already uh, supporting. Hmm. with different sums of money as working capital and also with um, technical know-how uh, know -how yeah, exactly. in terms of uh, faculty members okay. who are coaching. So some students, uh, even before they graduate, they have their businesses already as we speak. Right. And some of our Which is the proper thing to do, the yeah. right thing to do. Yeah. They are into all kinds of things yeah. and they are hmm. excited about it. Last time, sorry, right. Benjamin, last time Joy News did a story. Yeah. They came to campus to cover a story our students, three of them, were sent to the U.S. and the they, University of San Diego. San Diego, and they contested in a global student innovation contest, okay. and they came out number one in wow. the in the whole competition. How, how long ago was this? That was 2018. 2018. Okay. And they had started a factory using human excreta to 
produce oh, charcoal. I think I, I think you, you heard about followed, that. I, I, exactly. I heard a bit of that. So that's one of the things. And for that one, they won a, a seed capital of um, 15,000 US dollars to right. actually be able to implement the idea. They've set up their factory. Apart from that, we're also appealing to partners, sponsors, any organization that is interested in these tracks that we are talking about to partner with us. Whatever way you can support, either by mentorship or you know, incubation, whatever, if it's money to support any of those prototypes, you are invited to be part of it. The number to call is my number. Can I put it out now? Yeah, you can yeah. go ahead. So it's 020 One last time, out. just in case. Somebody. Yeah. 020 <laughs> Too. And uh, you can reach out to me and we can have a conversation about how you can be a partner in this particular innovation program. Conrad, I'm sure a lot of those who are watching are eager, especially young people. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And unemployment is a reality, yep. a stark reality in our yep. country. Yeah. Uh, who can participate? Is it, is it, or is it restricted to students of the Heritage Christian College? For now, yes, because they have a set limit for those that it can impart on and then yeah. after that we can now take it up as a university to invite any other person who is interested to come for that kind of training as well. So for now it is only for our university. Right, uh, for Doc, so we know that some processes went into, you actually put yourself forward yep. to host uh, this uh, impact week yep. and all of that. But what, what is it going to do for your university community, your college community, and maybe the nation at large? What, what is this going to do? Well, it, it's going to provide uh, problem-solving skills to our students, mm. even to our faculty, because before we train uh, our students, yeah. all faculty, how many of them? Uh, 25. Have okay, been so faculty themselves are going through this design thinking training. Yeah. Okay. So you can imagine the, the you know, ripple effect, the, the ripple effect yeah. uh, in terms of knowledge and ability to uh, solve problems at personal levels, at community levels, and, and district levels. Yeah. Mm. That's it. Tell me also about, I mean, someone may be curious about your institution, yeah. uh, the Heritage Christian uh, College. What, what, what can you tell us? Well, um, what else do you do, basically? Yeah. Okay. So, Heritage Christian College was set up and we became an accredited institution in 2015. It's so, very important, the bit about accreditation. Sure. Yeah. You know, in recent times, it's come That's to right. Exactly. So, so accredited by GTEC, yeah. uh, formerly NAB, NAB. but right. now Ghana Tertiary Education, Education Commission. Commission. Right. Uh, we are affiliated to KNUST. Yeah. Okay. And uh, we offer courses, uh, business related courses, IT and, uh, and theology. Um, yeah, mostly business and IT. Mm -hmm. That's our area of specialization. Now, the school was set up purposely to provide a missing link in tertiary education on the continent. Okay. And you may ask me, what is the missing link? Mm -hmm. Two areas. We are heavy on ethics where we are drawing on Christian principles, Christ-like values to, to inculcate in students and in everybody. That is number one. Mm. And secondly, we um, are finding creative, innovative ways of providing um, job-creating skills so that at the end of the period when our students graduate, we do not want to see them going around looking for jobs that are non-existent they should be able to create something. So ir irrespective of your major, irrespective of your area of specialization, whether you are studying accounting or Bible or IT, whatever it is, you go through uh, some hands-on entrepreneurial training, everybody. Mm. I mean, it's not, it, it's expected. <laughs> it is not, uh, it's for, uh, not for scoring. Yeah. So you don't get uh, a grade per se, but we have structures in place that makes it almost mandatory for everybody to right. go through some sort of a entrepreneurial training. Mm. And we think that people should, even though you may not have the natural flair uh, to become entrepreneur, but we think we should all think innovatively. Yeah. We should all think in ways that solve problems. Yeah. Mm. And, and therefore, that is one of our uh, distinctiveness, yeah. I would say. You, you remind me, I see you want to come in, but you remind me of the Apostle Paul. Uh, he would go and preach, but we all know he was a tent maker. I'm sure. So, That's it. so you must you we don't do have this time. on one hand. We don't have time. I've <laughs> told you. Have time. <laughs> the real work on the other hand. Yeah. So our annual uh, startup challenge that we organize yeah. on annual basis for right. our students, the guy that 
got the highest, I mean, the top award mm. last year, was a Bible major. And he has developed a business plan where he's producing uh, free juice. And wow. he was sponsored mm -hmm. by our Center for Entrepreneurship. Yeah. So that is the nature of school. We are not out to make profit. <laughs> it's it's a faith-based you know, institution. And our goal is to make a difference in, in, in the way I've just described. Right. So I see you have some words uh, to share with us. Final words. Yeah. Uh, add the, how people can reach out okay. to the Heritage uh, Christian, Christian College, College as well. Interesting. So um, we are very excited to host Impact Week 2022 yeah. in Ghana for the third time. And it's coming live at Heritage Christian College. We are calling out to everybody who is interested in using innovative ways to solve the problems that we are saddled with to reach out to us. Uh, you can follow us on our uh, Facebook page, Heritage Christian College. On our website, just Google Heritage Christian College or www.hcuc.edu.gh. www.hcuc.edu.gh. And then you can be a partner of this particular program. All right, it's been refreshing and uh, more power to your elbow. I Thank mean, you. <laughs> uh, we can only wish you well. The, the very things you're talking about, I'm passionate about young people, yeah. youth, and youth unemployment yeah. is a, a serious matter in the country. So if you're going along those lines, we can only wish you the very best. Thank, Thank you. you very much. All right, <laughs> we've just been engaging Dr. Samuel Chumesi Ankara, President, Heritage uh, Christian College, Amasaman, as well as Conrad Kakraba, Chairman of the Local Planning Committee, Impact Week Ghana 20. 22. Gentlemen, thank you so much. It's a pleasure. We take a breather here, and when we return, uh, a lot more on uh, the AM show, of course, NSMQ, and uh, we'll just be taking your thoughts as well on the matters we've been discussing. Stay. Thank you for staying, and of course, you know, when we talk about NSMQ, then the battle is heating up when it comes to science and math. Competing schools are arriving in Kumase for the National Science and Math Quiz, and this year's contest, like last year's, will take place at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. We've got updates for you. Emmanuel bright who my colleague, is on the ground and joins us now. E Emmanuel, so tell us, what exactly is the mood? What is the expectation? What is happening right now in Kumasi? City. And I am right here in front of Brunei, here at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. The rains are not stopping us from hosting this year's edition of the National Science and Math Quiz. We understand that some schools are arriving today for the preliminary stage of the competition. So I'm here to engage with the coordinator of the National Science and Math Quiz, the program's coordinator, that is Stephen Yankee, for us to engage with him and then find out more what we should expect, what are the activities for the day, and know a lot more what should we expect in this year's competition, what is special about this year's competition. So I'll, I'll call Mr. Stephen Yankee to join me, and then we begin our interactions. All right, good morning, Mr. Yankee. Good morning, Chief. I trust you well. I'm doing well. I hope you are fine too. I'm very fine. All right. So um, we know this year we are starting the National Science and Math Quiz, particularly here in KNUST. Help us understand what are the activities for today. We understand some schools are arriving today. Help us understand what are the schools who are arriving. How many should we expect for today? Yes. Um, so today is when the schools officially um, arrive here on campus. Um, as you can see, we are um, right here at the Brunei Complex. This is where we are going to be hosting all the participating schools um, who will be taking part in this year's competition. Today we are expecting 54 out of the, the 117 schools that are taking part um, in the prelims of this year's competition. I think as at this morning we already have uh, about two schools in. Uh, Akachi Senior High Technical School is in and then um, Queen of Peace Senior High School from Nadoli in the Upper West Region has also arrived. We are expecting about 52 more um, in the course of the day. And then tomorrow we'll have another set of um, about um, 60, 60 schools also coming in 
to make up the total list of schools that are competing at the preliminary stage. So once they come in today, we will start with the orientation. And every year since we introduce the, uh, the interactive screens that the students use for the problem of the day, as soon as they arrive, we have a room that is set up with a number of these screens so that we can take them through how to use them um, effectively because we understand that when they are training back in school they do not use um, these kind of screens so it's important that we really train them on how to use them properly so our team is ready so that as they register they can quickly go into that room and see how um, they can um, write easily on these interactive screens then um, beyond that uh, our venues for the competition are also set up we are ready uh, to start a contest on Monday the Sarah Men's Auditorium is, is ready. We have Kuma Play Auditorium also set up. And then the Great Hall at KNESHS is also ready to host um, the contest. You know, this year we are hosting the prelims at three venues. Um, that is from Monday to Thursday. And all these venues are set up. The team from Prime Time has been working hard to ensure that everything will take place seamlessly. Now, tomorrow, uh, Saturday, we also start orientation for the schools that arrived today. And then for the schools that will arrive tomorrow, uh, that Saturday, they will have their orientation on Sunday morning. Also on Sunday, we would have um, the teachers forum. Every year, we have a forum like that where uh, teachers get to interact with the consultants and quiz mistresses and ask from prime time if they have any issues, we address them to see how we can make this whole experience much better for them. That's also happening on Sunday. And then for the first time, we, we have... Um, time with the NSMQ alum. This year um, we have been honored to have with us uh, the, the CEO of GNPC, who is himself a former contestant of the NSMQ. Uh, he's, he's made time out of his very, very busy schedule to come and spend some time with the contestants this year. And that's going to be happening on Sunday also in camp. So it's all part of the activities to make the experience one that these students will remember. And for us, we're excited to, to start the national championship. But one will ask, why KNUST again? Last year, we hosted at KNUST. But why not any other region or going back to Accra, but we are back again to KNUST campus? Well, why not? Uh, last year, we all enjoyed the competition here in Kumasi. Um, since the, the National Science and Maths Quiz started in, in, in 1994, um, we've had a national championship being held in Accra from the very beginning. Last year was great to have been able to finally move it out of Accra uh, to Kumasi. It, it, it had been something that we had been preparing for, for for a number of years at prime time. We had been to KNUST at least on about three occasions to um, look at the, uh, the facilities they have and how they could, they, they, they could work uh, with the kind of numbers we deal with and all of that, just as we were doing on Legon campus. And last year, it went very well. I think we all enjoyed the experience in Kumasi. The reception was great. The support from the old students here in Kumasi was massive. So we said, well, why not just try it again? So we're happy to be back here in Kumasi. Uh, I don't know about where we'll be next year. It's too early to tell. But uh, trust us that uh, we, we still have something exciting coming up this year. I'm just hoping you don't go away from Kumasi. You stay in Kumasi for us again, once again. But we want to also find out, um, just before the competition started, or just um, some few weeks ago, we understand some nine schools who couldn't qualify for the national competition were later on added. Help us understand why that decision. Yes, um, so you know, um, ordinarily we have 135 schools that take part in a national championship. Now out of this 135, 27 of them are the seeded schools. These schools are the ones that made it to the quarterfinal stage the, pre the previous year. So we are talking about the 27 schools that made it to quarterfinals in 2021. So they gain automatic qualification. That leaves um, 108 schools that are coming directly from the regional qualifiers. Now, what we had been thinking about um, over the years was that sometimes you see schools qualifying from their regions, some as low as 10, 11, 12 points. And then you have others also failing to qualify because they lost their contest with, say, 45, 42, 43 points. And sometimes uh, it's painful to see when these things happen um, some will say that, well, a win is a win. So, uh, they, were, they were fortunate to get a contest where they could win with 13 points or 11 points to qualify. Someone too, uh, was not fortunate enough so that they met a, a stronger school so that even their 43 points was not enough. So what we try to do this year 
is to invite some other schools that qualify with more than 40 points, and there were nine of them. So with more than 40 points at the regional qualifiers, they lost their contest though, but because of their high scores, we gave them the opportunity to participate in the national championship. And again, this is not the very first time we are doing this. Uh, 2020, uh, during the pandemic, we did that when we had the regional prelims. 2021, we did the same, inviting schools to come and participate based on their high scores in their regions. So we're just following the same tradition. And I think that those uh, nine schools are very excited for the opportunity to also come and uh, have a taste of the national championship. Even if it was last minute, they were all like, excited. And you know, the interesting thing is that all of these schools were still preparing uh, in the hopes that they will be invited. So none of them really was caught by surprise at all, but they were very excited and I think we're happy to see. We hope that some of these uh, nine schools can make a good impression. I think that would make it a, a nice story to tell. Okay. Some people would argue that why would you choose the highest score and not, let's say, a school that is less endowed and they managed to get Ghana some points, but I didn't consider that. Well, you see, in a competition, you are, you, are, you are talking about who is first or second or third. So, first of all, the, the very first stage is that if you win your contest, you qualify. That's the 108 schools. Now, if somebody didn't win, what is the basis for, for inviting them? The next option to consider is who lost their contest but with very high scores. Now mind you, some of these nine schools have scores that are higher than about half of the schools that we have already in the contest. So these are equally good schools. If they were in contests that didn't feature more stronger schools, they would have qualified also on their own merit. So I think that we uh, thought it wise to invite these nine to come in and be part of the competition, join the 108 schools so that in all we can, we can have 117 schools at the preliminary stage this year. So instead of the traditional 36 contests that we used to organize at the prelim stage, we have 39 contests this time across um, three venues, 13 contests at each venue starting from Monday all the way till Thursday. So how many schools are we looking at for this year's competition? So in total, we have 144 schools. So that's the, we have the 119 schools at the prelims, then we have the 27 seeded schools. So that leaves us with 144 schools. Right. Um, I know most of the time, um, every stage of the competition has a particular price, especially with the problem of the day, you answering five points, getting the five points at the uh, riddle. We want to understand, for the preliminary stage, is there anything like that? Yes, for sure. Um, all the prizes that were at stake last year are back again this year. In round three, uh, which is the problem of the day, we have the Prudential Life Insurance and SMQ Star. This is sponsored by uh, Prudential Life Insurance Ghana. Um, what they are doing is that if a school scores 10 out of 10 in the problem of the day, irrespective of the stage, from prelims to the finals, you walk away with some prize money to each of the contestants and also to their teacher. Now, when you get to um, round five, which is the round of riddles, we have the Goyle Riddle Bonanza, sponsored by Ghana's number one OMC, that is Goyle. Uh, Goyle is sponsoring this particular uh, prize. So if a school solves three or all four riddles, they also benefit from the Goyle Riddle Bonanza. Then on every competition day, the school that emerges the highest in terms of points, the highest scorer for the day would also win the Airtel Tigo Highest Scorer Award. So at the preliminary stage, these are the prizes that we have at stake. As we move on from, from prelims to 1-8 and then to quarterfinals, then we get into the APSA Bank Money Zone, where based on your score, you get some prize money attached to that. So these are the kind of prizes we are looking at just from the preliminary stage all the way to the grand finale, where we have the even bigger uh, grand prizes that we are looking at this year. Then I'm pretty sure if some of these schools do not even manage to go to, through to the competition, they are taking something home. Yes, you know, so that's why um, uh, Professor Elsie F. Kaufman continues to say that since these corporate sponsors came on board to support us with prizes, 
uh, in the past, people will lose their contest and they will cry a lot on stage. But <laughs> on a lighter note, it, it seems when, when these uh, corporate sponsors came on board with the NSMQ star, with the highest scorer award, with the gold redo bonanza, uh, we don't see as much crying because, you know, even if you cry small, you, you can use the prize money to wipe your tears yeah. after the contest. <laughs> Definitely. So you do want to make your school win this year's competition. At every stage, you are, you are just hoping that they will get something to go home. Even if you don't get the bragging rights as the best science school in Ghana, at least you take home a cash prize. And then finally, we just want to find out from you, um, what should we expect from this year's competition? Is there anything special that we should expect? Yes, uh, certainly. Um, for us at prime time, um, we are poised to deliver a very exciting competition. Uh, and we know that our fans would really love what is coming their way um, when we start the actual competition on Monday. Um, every year we set out to, to, to do even better than the previous year's edition. So if you think that the, the 2021 edition was exciting, please watch out for the 2022 edition. It's going to blow your mind. Uh, we, are, we are poised to, to deliver an excellent contest right here from Kumasi from the 10th to the 26th of uh, October. And I would like to take this opportunity to say a big thank you to all our sponsors who are making this possible. Uh, first of all, to the Ghana Education Service. They are our main sponsors. And without the support of the Ghana Education Service, uh, we wouldn't be able to pull off such a, a big production year in, year out. I would like, also like to say a big thank you to Goyle, to Prudential Life Insurance Ghana, to Airtel Tigo. Um, Dano Milk has also come through for us again this year. We have support from GNPC, Newmont Ghana is also supporting us. Then our academic sponsors, um, Accra College of Medicine and Academic City University College also giving us a lot of support. And certainly we also have uh, support from Joy News for the extensive coverage and then also YFM. We'd like to say a big thank you to all of them and our partner sponsor, APSA Bank, for all that they are doing to ensure that this year's program Will be will be a successful one and okay. um, you made mention of the fact that Accra um, medical school is do, is giving out something um, how many contestants are we looking at in this year's edition so um, one contestant will benefit from this scholarship so we have um, one full medical school scholarship from Accra College of uh, Medicine and then we have another full presidential scholarship from a Academic City University College going for one of the contestants even beyond that GNPC is also going to be offering um, five scholarships to some promising contestants this year through uh, some support that we, we've received from GNPC. So apart from the academic scholarships from um, ACM and Academic City, we also have the GNPC scholarships coming up this year. Okay. And we're excited about that. All right. So um, somebody would argue that why should we always... Why should these NSMQ um, contestants be moving towards medicine, reading medicine and not engineering? Why are you not sponsoring any students to study um, engineering? Well, we only have one scholarship that is uh, from a medical institution, that is uh, um, Accra College of Medicine. The scholarship from Academic City is purely on computer science or engineering related programs. And for us uh, at prime time, we are not uh, pushing contestants to all move into medicine as uh, the only um, avenue out there. If you follow our mentorship sessions, we use the mentorship sessions to help these students to see that there are many other career paths out there in the field of STEM, which is, is not just limited to, to medicine. And we have done that over the, 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 the last about five or six years bringing on board seasoned personalities in, in the fields of science and tech so that they know that apart from medical school, you can still have a promising, illustrious uh, professional career that you, you, you would be excited about. And that's what we set out to do this year. The time with the NSMQ alum this Sunday, the GNPC CEO, he's not a doctor, and he's going to help these students to see the various career prospects that are out there in the fields of engineering and all of that. And for us, that's what we want to do. We, we, we don't want all our contestants to end up in medical school. We want them to venture into other fields of, of engineering and other areas so that we can benefit as a country. I know you wouldn't be rooting, um, you, are, you are a neutral person, but which school are you rooting for to win this year's competition? I'm rooting for the best school in this year's competition. 
Yes, I, I'll keep that. <laughs> yeah. All right, definitely. When, when the school wins, I'll tell you. <laughs> the winning school is the one I'm rooting for. All right, sure. Thank you very much, Mr. <laughs> Stephen Yankee. So I was just interacting with Mr. Stephen Yankee. He is the coordinator, the program's coordinator for Primetime Limited, the organizers of the National Science and Math Quiz. So you do want to join us from Monday through to Thursday, that is when the preliminary stage of the competition, we are expecting 119 schools to compete in that particular stage of the competition. And then whoever progresses or wins that contest will be progressing onto the 1-8 stage where we'll be meeting the 27 other seeded schools in the competition. So you, you do want to expect a lot more from this year's edition of the National Science and Math Quiz. But before we go, let me run you by um, the sponsors for this year's National Science and Math Quiz. The, the 2022 National Science and Math Quiz is produced by the Prime Time Limited and sponsored by the Ghana Education Service in partnership with APSA Ghana. The broadcast of the National Science and Math Quiz is on Joy News as you're watching right now, and is supported by Visual Info Sec Africa, Virtual Security Africa, Vita Milk, Cowbell, Alumni by Enterprise, Fay International Limited, Ace Medical Insurance, Azar Group, King's Group Limited, Family Health Medical School, DBS, Corba, and Pharma Trust Limited. So this is what you should expect from this year's edition of the National Science and Math Quiz. We'll be bringing you every bit, every nit, uh, nitty and gritty of this particular competition. We'll be bringing you the latest updates from the competition, right from the preliminary, even when they are camping here at Brunei. So from here at Kumasi, my name is Emmanuel Bright Kweku. We are organisms whose genetic materials have been altered. Yes, Eden? Genetical, genetically modified organisms. Yes. I was reading the fifth clue. Three points. I am deflected by an inhomogeneous magnetic field which can split an unpolarized beam of me into two beams. I am composed of three spin-half fractional charge particles. In the free state, I decay with a half-life. Eden? A neutron. Yes. case, this is usually at the national level. I involve collection of information from all individuals in a population. Yes, Joel. Population census. You are right. Keta Senior High Technical School has 30 points. Presbyterian Boys Secondary School has 49 points. Trempe College has 53 points. Keta Senior High Technical School, it is not easy to get into the grand finale of the National Science and Math Quiz. You've worked really hard and you've done well. You are a bronze medalist. Presbyterian Boys Secondary School, congratulations. You are Ah, uh, silver medalist. Well done. Prempe College, congratulations on your win. It is my pleasure to declare you a champion. 2021 NSMQ champions. Another fantabulous Friday, hasn't it? I've enjoyed your company. I've enjoyed being here. And of course, you can stay tuned for a lot more Nathaniel Atto, my colleague, 
ahead of World Cup 2022. But before we go, hello Ghana, happy moment is here. Let's storm World Cup Qatar 2022 with Storm Energy Drink, Puma Soft Drinks, Awake Drinking Water as well, all from the stables of Casa Preco Company Limited. Simply buy your favorite Storm Energy Drink, Puma Soft Drinks and Awake Drinking Water. Text that four-digit unique number on the neck of the bottle to short code star 780 hash. Choose option two, follow the prompts on all networks for free, and you could be one of the lucky winners to this year's World Cup in the monthly draw. You could also win TVs, fridges, microwave ovens, mobile phones, home theaters, free drinks, and a lot more instantly. So don't waste any time. Grab a bottle of Storm Energy Drink, Puma Soft Drinks, and Awake Drinking Water, and let's storm Qatar this World Cup. This promotion is on the NLA Caritas platform. This advert is FDA approved. Do remember, terms and conditions do apply. And on that note, uh, let's just uh, call it a day. But before we go, we have a message. And let me just uh, quickly get into that one. Uh, I just have to find it out because uh, my own colleague, Kojo uh, Brace, sent in that one. We have to do it. Nano Usu Setre Adjaman, a proud young Ghanaian boy. May God bless you as you turn five today. And uh, my friend, continue being a shining light to the world, a blessed new age young man. And it's from your friend, Samuel Kojo Brace. We will do anything for the children. And so at age five, we celebrate you, Nano Usu Setre Adjaman. Have a wonderful day. God bless you. On that note, we hang our boots on the AM show, but up next... All the news, everything you need to know on Joy News Desk. Do stay.